Welcome to our big data crash course where we embark on an insightful journey into the world of data at an unprecedented scale. We'll cover what big data is, introduce you to the top 7 big data technologies, explain HDFS and dive into the Hadoop ecosystem. We'll also showcase some exciting data engineering projects. It's a practical journey into the realm of data, made simple for everyone to understand and use. So let's get started. So if you are interested in mastering the world of data engineering, look no further than our postgraduate program in data engineering. This comprehensive course is tailor-made for professionals like you, diving deep into the essential topics such as Hadoop framework, Spark-based data processing, Kafka-driven data pipelines, and the intricacies of managing big data on AWS and Azure cloud infrastructures. A unique approach blends live session, hands-on industry projects, exciting IBM hackathons, and interactive Ask Me Anything sessions to provide you with the most enriching learning experience. Elevate your data engineering skills and career prospects today. For admission to this data engineering course, a bachelor's degree with an average of 50% or higher marks is required, a 2 plus years of work experience is preferred, and basic understanding of object-oriented programming is preferred. So enroll now. Hi, I am Asad Shah from Canada, and I recently upskilled myself with the professional certification program in data engineering offered by Simply Learn in collaboration with Purdue University. After working for a long time in SQL domain, moving to big data was a great challenge for me. I needed to upgrade my skills to improve my performance in my current course. Curriculum is well formulated, well industry relevant concepts and project, which helped me grasp deeper knowledge about big data. Now I can easily carry out my big data projects as well as successfully lead a team of engineers. I even got a decent salary hike. The world is moving at a much faster pace than we think. Make sure you don't lag behind. So upskill yourself and move to a step forward and step closer to your dream. Agle 30 seconds mein aap badal sakte hain apne life ka track and never look back. Yaar chhodo ye sare hacks and simply learn to get ahead. Jaise ke Danish, a civil engineer turned data scientist who decided to simply learn. Aur kaise hua ye possible? With a course from a premier university, mere career ne liya ek naya direction. True champion who upskilled to win big. How big? A massive hike that transformed my life. Danish changed gears pretty early in the race. But Prasen wanted to explore more to get ahead. Isiliye usne kara Simply Learn. From mechanical engineering to a data analyst and a podcaster in his free time. Aisa career transformation kaise bro? Simply Learn ke industry experts se sikha live. Aur khud ban gaya data expert. Itna kuch, itni jaldi. Difficult to raha hoga. With a well-structured course, it felt like a piece of cake. That is simply awesome. What's also awesome is that no saal ke long career ke baad, Nitin didn't choose a quick fix. He just added data science into the mix. Nitin, how did you change the game? Worked on real industry problems to become the real deal. A joint family, a regular job, responsibilities to bahut thi, but nothing could stop Nitin from getting ahead. What an all-rounder. Day ho ya night, with flexible learning, you can always make it right. Passion your situation, chahe jo bhi ho. Nitin, Danish or Prasan ki tarah, you too will find your way to get ahead when you simply learn. Kyunki aap ke liye shortcuts nahi, simply learn hai sahi. Get ahead with simply learn. What is big data? Big data is extremely large or complex set of data, and it's so large that it's difficult to process it using traditional database and software techniques. Every day we are creating approximately 2.5 quintillion bytes of data. So where is this huge amount of data getting generated from? Earlier, we had mobile phones with the functionality of calling and text messages, or clicking some pictures maybe. But with the new technologies like smartphones, we have a lot of applications for music, sports, social media like Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and many more. Also, data is getting generated when we shop online. So why does it need attention? As the data is growing, companies are capturing the data that streams into their businesses. They can apply analytics and get significant value from it with better speed and efficiency. Companies are leveraging the benefits of big data by analyzing the patterns and trends and predicting something useful out of it. For example, 
Companies like Amazon and Netflix use big data to improve customer experience. As we see here from the statistics shown, by 2020, 1.7 megabytes of data will be created every second for each human. This needs immediate attention because this data can't be just thrown away. It's going to give profit to the businesses. Big Data Challenges Big data is not just about the volume of data. It poses other challenges as well, like velocity and variety. As a volume, 40 zettabytes of data will be created by 2020. This huge volume of data is either human-generated, like from social media, YouTube, or can be machine-generated, like through sensors and personal health trackers, and can also be generated with organizations, like credit card details, commercial transactions, and medical records. Another challenge is velocity. The speed at which data is coming into the system, the data needs to be processed with faster speed. And then there is variety of data. Data is not only structured, but unstructured and semi-structured data, like images, videos, and tweets. So how are enterprises using this big data today? Let us see big data popular use cases. Internet of Things. These are numerous ways in which analytics can be applied to Internet of Things. For example, sensors are used to collect data that can be analyzed to achieve actionable insights, tracking customer or product movement, etc. Many enterprises are creating a dashboard application that provides a 360-degree view of the customers that pulls data from a variety of sources analyzes it, and presents it to customer service. So that allows them to gather the rich insights about businesses. Big data popular use cases are related information security and data warehouse optimizations. Big data tools are being used to remove some of the burdens from the data warehouses. Even the healthcare industry is looking for patterns in treatment that lead to the best outcomes for patients. The main challenge of big data is storing and processing the data at a specified time span. The traditional approach is not efficient in doing that. So Hadoop technology and various big data tools have emerged to solve the challenges faced in the big data environment. So there are a lot of big data tools and all of them help the user in some or another way in saving time, money, and uncovering business insights. These can be divided into the following categories, like data storage and management. For example, the NoSQL databases such as MongoDB, Cassandra, Neo4j, and HBase are popular NoSQL databases. The Talend, Hadoop, Microsoft HD Insight, and Zookeeper are popular for data storage and management tools. Next broad category is data cleaning. Data needs to be cleaned up and well-structured. Examples of such tools which help in defining and reshaping the data into usable data sets are Microsoft Excel and OpenRefine. Data mining is a process of discovery insights within a database. Some of the popular tools used for data mining are Teradata and RapidMiner. Data visualization tools are a useful way of conveying the complex data insights in a pictorial way that is easy to understand. For example, Tableau and IBM Watson Analytics and Plotly are the common tools. For data reporting, Power BI tools are used. Data ingestion is the process of getting the data into Hadoop Ford, which can be done using Scoop, Flume, or Storm. Data analysis requires asking questions and finding the answers in data. The popular tools used for data analysis are Hive, Pig, MapReduce, and Spark. Data acquisition is also used for acquiring the data, for which Scoop, Flume, or Storm tools are quite popular. The popular big data tools offer a lot of advantages which can be summarized as follows. They provide the analysts with advanced analytics algorithm and models. They help the user to run on big data platforms such as Hadoop or any high-performance analytics systems. 
They help the user to work not only with structured data, but unstructured and semi-structured data coming from multiple sources. And it's quite easy to visualize the analyzed data in a form that helps in conveying the complex data insights in a pictorial way, which is easy to understand by users. Big data tools help you to integrate with other technologies very easily. Thank you so much for listening to the video. In today's world, we create a massive amount of information every day. To understand and use all this data, companies use advanced technologies. In this video on top big data technologies in 2024, we will learn about the top big data technologies that are changing how we analyze data. These tools help us process data and use it for the things like machine learning. From managing and processing data to conducting sophisticated machine learning analysis, these technologies play an important role in using the immense power of data. They are like the tools in a data scientist toolbox, enabling businesses to make informed decisions, optimize operations, and gain a competitive edge. So let's get started with this video. But before we begin, let me ask you a quick question. So which technology is commonly used for processing and analyzing big data? Option A is Apache Hadoop. Option B is Microsoft Excel. Option C is Adobe Photoshop. And option D is JavaScript. Now you can pause this video and answer in the comment section below. So let's start exploring these important technologies. First technology on the list is Apache Hadoop. Apache Hadoop is like a superhero of the big data world. It is an amazing open source tool that's been at the heart of big data revolution. Think of it as a magical framework that's specially designed to handle and make sense of incredibly huge piles of data, all while using a bunch of regular computers. Now, the secret sauce of Hadoop is its two main parts that is Hadoop Distributed File Systems, that is HDFS and MapReduce. HDFS is like a super organized librarian that keeps all your data neatly in order and MapReduce is like a team of super fast workers who can process this data lightning quick. The cool thing about Hadoop is that it can work with many regular everyday computers making it super flexible and cost effective. You don't need any fancy expensive hardware etc. Hadoop can take your data and spread it out across many computers like a big puzzle. This way it's stored safely and processed super fast because all these computers can work on it together. So this was about Apache Hadoop. Now second on the list we have is Apache Spark. So Apache Spark is a popular and efficient tool that can be used instead of Hadoop's MapReduce. It has a special feature called in-memory processing which means it can work with the data faster. This makes it a great choice for people who work with data like engineers and analysts. What's cool about Spark is that it can do a lot of different things. It can handle batch processing, interactive queries, and real-time data streaming, and even process data as it's coming in. This makes it a flexible and powerful tool. So in summary, Apache Spark is a fast and versatile tool that's great for people who work with data. It can do a lot of different things and is preferred choice for many professionals. Next we have is Apache Kafka. Apache Kafka is a super smart messenger for data. It's designed to handle lots of information flying around in real time. Imagine you have a huge amount of data that needs to be sent from one place to another quickly and safely. That's where Kafka comes in. Think of it as a super highway for data where information can flow smoothly and reliably. It's like having a special mail system that never loses your letters or packages no matter how much you send. Kafka is super important because it helps businesses and applications keep up with the latest information. It's like having a news feed that never stops updating. So you always know what's happening right now. One of the cool things about Kafka is that it can handle a lot of data at once and it's really good at making sure none of that data gets lost along the way. So if you're building a system that needs to stay update in real time, Kafka is a key tool to have in your toolkit. Next big data technology in 2024 is Apache Hive. Apache Hive is a helpful tool that makes it easier for people to analyze and query data stored in Hadoop. It does this by providing a user-friendly interface that looks a lot like SQL called HiveQL. This means that even if you are not a tech expert, you can still use Hive to work with data in Hadoop. Hive takes the queries you write and turns them into tasks that can be processed by Hadoop's MapReduce or Apache Tests. These are just fancy terms for the behind-the-scenes operations that happen in Hadoop to process and analyze data. So you don't have to worry about the nitty-gritty details. Hive takes care of it for you. Here, the Hadoop itself can store all sorts of data including structured and semi-structured in a system called HDFS. Hive is like a bridge that connects you to this data making it accessible and easy to work with. 
So in a nutshell, Apache Hive is a handy tool that lets people who may not be tech visas easily query and analyze data stored in Hadoop HDFS thanks to its SQL-like interface and smart data processing capabilities. All right, next we have is Presto. So Presto is a powerful tool that helps people analyze data from different sources like Hadoop, Cassandra, and regular databases. It's like a super smart detective that can find and make sense of data no matter where it's stored. This is really useful because it means you can explore and study data without having to worry about where it is kept. Imagine you have a big puzzle with pieces scattered all over the room. Presto is like the detective who can find all those pieces and put the puzzle together for you even if some pieces are under the couch. Presto acts like a super smart search engine for your data. It helps you find and use your data no matter where it is hiding. So if you want to understand your business better, Presto can help you get all the answers you need from your data. So if you are interested in mastering the world of data engineering, look no further than a post gadget program in data engineering. This comprehensive course is tailor made for professionals like you. In this course, you will be diving deep into essential topics such as Hadoop framework, Spark based data processing, Kafka driven data pipelines and the intricacies of managing big data on AWS and Azure cloud infrastructures. Our unique approach blends live session, hands on industry projects, exciting IBM hackathons and interactive ask me anything sessions to provide you with the most enriching learning experience. For admission to this data engineering course, candidates need a bachelor's degree with an average of 50% or higher marks, two plus years of work experience, then basic understanding of object-oriented programming that is preferred. So elevate your data engineering skills and career prospects today. Enroll now. Hi, I am Asad Shah from Canada and I recently upskilled myself with the professional certification program in data engineering offered by Simply Learn in collaboration with Purdue University. After working for a long time in SQL domain, moving to big data was a great challenge for me. I needed to upgrade my skills to improve my performance in my current course. Curriculum is well formulated, well industry relevant concepts and project, which helped me grasp deeper knowledge about big data. Now I can easily carry out my big data projects as well as successfully lead a team of engineers. I even got a decent salary hike. The world is moving at a much faster pace than we think. Make sure you don't lag behind. So upskill yourself and move to a step forward and step closer to your dream. So the next big technology on the list for 2024 is Rapid Miner. So Rapid Miner is a user-friendly and open source platform for data science that helps organizations build and use predictive models even if they don't have advanced programming skills. This means that anyone who works with data can benefit from its features regardless of their level of expertise. One of the great things about Rapid Miner is that it can handle a variety of tasks related to data such as preparing and cleaning it, training it and like training machine learning models and deploying these models for practical use. This makes it versatile tool that can be used in different stages of data project. So whether you are a data scientist or just someone who occasionally works with data, Rapid Miner can simplify your workflow and make it easier to achieve your goals. It's designed to be accessible and user friendly, so you don't need to be a coding expert to get the most out of it. All right, coming to the last one, that is the last big data technology for 2024, which is Apache Cassandra. Apache Cassandra is a type of database that is specifically designed to handle a lot of data in a highly reliable and efficient manner. It is particularly well suited for situations where you need to store and access large amounts of information quickly and without any disruptions. One of the key features of Cassandra is its ability to handle a large amount of data points across multiple computers or nodes, which makes it a greater choice for applications that need to process a high volume of information. This distributed nature of Cassandra also ensures that even if one node fails, the system will still keep running smoothly, making it incredibly fault tolerant. Cassandra is often used in industries and applications that require fast and reliable data storage and retrieval. For example, in the Internet of Things, that is IoT, where a massive number of devices are constantly generating data. Cassandra can efficiently manage this influx of information. Similarly, e-commerce websites and social media platforms that need to handle numerous transactions and user interactions find Cassandra to be a valuable tool. So these were the top big data technologies in 2024. To sum up, these leading big data technologies, Apache Hadoop, Apache Spark, Apache Kafka, Apache Hive, Presto, etc. are the forefront of data processing and analytics today. They have transformed the way organizations handle and utilize data. Whether it's managing large data sets, enabling real-time processing, orchestrating data pipelines, or optimizing.
queries. Welcome to our video on HDFS, the Hadoop Distributed File System. If you have ever worked with big data or in the field of data engineering, you have probably heard of Hadoop. It's revolutionized the way we handle and analyze large data sets. But what is HDFS and why should you learn it? HDFS is a distributed file system designed to handle the high throughput computing needs of large scale data processing systems. It was designed to run on clusters of community hardware, making it cost effective way to process large amount of data. One of the main benefits of HDFS is its scalability. It can handle petabytes of data across thousands of nodes, making it well suited for big data applications. Another key feature of HDFS is its fault tolerance. It can handle node failures without losing data, ensuring uninterrupted data processing. But why should you learn HDFS? Well, if you're planning a career in data engineering, it's an essential skill. HDFS serves as a foundational infrastructure for the Hadoop ecosystem, enabling other tools like MapReduce and Spark to process and analyze large volume of data efficiently. So, whether you are an aspiring data engineer or just curious about Hadoop, learning HDFS is a great place to start. In this video, we will explore the basics of HDFS from its architecture and data modeling to best practices for managing data. Let's dive in. On that note, Consider the data engineering postgraduate program offered by Simply Learn in collaboration with Purdue University and IBM, which present an excellent opportunity for professionals seeking practical exposure. This comprehensive program is designed to equip participants with essential data engineering skills and is closely aligned with AWS and Azure certifications, ensuring industry relevance and recognition. Fast track your career as a data engineering professional with our data engineering course. This course covers big data and data engineering concepts, the Hadoop ecosystem, Apache Python basics, AWS EMR, QuickSight, SageMarker, the AWS Cloud Platform, and Azure services. Check out the course link in the description for more details. Having previously covered the introduction of HDFS, let's now explore a deeper understanding of the definition of Hadoop Distributed File System. Hadoop Distributed File System or HDFS is a specifically designed distributed file system that stores and processes large volume of data across multiple commodity hardware nodes. It is a fundamental element within the Apache Hadoop ecosystems, providing fault tolerance, high throughput, and scalability. For a better understanding, let's illustrate HDFS using a simple layman's example. So now, imagine you have a large library with thousands of books. Managing such a massive collection efficiently can be challenging. So, to address this, you organize the books into a distributed system with multiple bookshelves. In this example, the library represents the HDFS. The books in the library represents the data such as files and the bookshelves in the library represents the data nodes in HDFS. And the librarian who keeps track of the books and their location represents the name node in the HDFS. You achieve better scalability, fault tolerance, and efficient data access by organizing your library into a distributed system. Similarly, HDFS enables large-scale data storage, fault tolerance, and parallel processing for big data applications. Now let's look at the architecture of HDFS. From the given diagram below, name node is the master node in HDFS. It stores the metadata about the file system, including directory tree, file permissions, and file-to-block mapping. It keeps tracks of data blocks location and coordinate data access operations. And then we have data nodes. Data nodes are the slave nodes in HDFS. They store the data blocks and perform read and write operation as the name node directs. Data nodes are responsible for data block creation, deletion, and replication. From we have blocks. So HDFS stores data in large blocks, typically 64 or 128 megabytes. Here, each file is divided into blocks and replicated across multiple data nodes for fault tolerance. Rack. So, a rack is a collection of data nodes grouped based on a physical proximity. It helps in improving data locality and reduces network traffic. In HDFS, a client refers to the entity or applications that interact with the Hadoop distributed file system. It is typically a software program or component that utilizes the HDFS API to perform various operations on files stored in HDFS. The client communicates with the HDFS clusters to request file operations like reading, writing, or modifying. Now let's have a look at the file operations like file read and file write. So here, the client can read the contents of the files stored in HDFS. 
it communicates with the name node to obtain the locations of the data blocks, connects the appropriate data nodes to retrieve the data. The client can read the entire file or specific portion of it. Next, file write. Here, the client can write data to files in HDFS. It communicates with the name node to obtain block locations and then interact with data nodes to write the data blocks. The client can perform single writes or append data to existing files. And next we have data modeling in HDFS. HDFS follows a write once read many model, which means that once a file is written, it is not modified. However, new data can be appended to the existing file. So here are some key aspects of data modeling in HDFS. First we have file organization. Files in HDFS are organized in a hierarchical directory structure, similar to the traditional file system. Directories can be created to manage and collect the data effectively. Next we have replication. HDFS replicates data blocks across multiple data nodes for fault tolerance. The default replication factor is typically 3, meaning each block is stored on 3 data nodes. The replication factor can be configured based on the desired level of fault tolerance. And the third we have data locality. HDFS optimizes data access by keeping the computation close to the data. It tries to schedule tasks on the same data nodes where the data blocks are stored to the minim it tries to schedule tasks on the same data nodes where the data blocks are stored to minimize network transfer. And next we are moving on to the best practices for managing data in HDFS. Effectively manage data in HDFS, consider the following best practices. First, we have data organization. Design a logical directory structure that suits your data access patterns and facilitates easy data management. Organize data into meaningful directories and subdirectories. Next, we have file size. HDFS performs best with large files rather than a large number of small files. Aim to have multiple file size of the block size to maximize data locality. Next, we have replication factor. Configure the replications factor based on the importance of the data and the available storage capacity. Higher replication factors provide better fault tolerance but require more storage. Next, monitoring and maintenance. Regularly monitor your HDFS cluster's health and promptly address any issues. Monitor disk space utilization, block distributions and cluster performance. Next, backup and disaster recovery. Implement a backup and disaster recovery strategy to ensure data durability. Regularly backup critical data and replicate it across different cluster or locations. Following these guidelines lets you maximum HDFS architecture and feature to effectively store and process large scale data. So if you are interested in mastering the world of data engineering, look no further than our postgraduate program in data engineering. This comprehensive course is tailor made for professionals like you diving deep into the essential topics such as Hadoop framework, Spark based data processing, Kafka driven data pipelines and the intricacies of managing big data on AWS and Azure cloud infrastructures. A unique approach blends live session, hands on industry projects, exciting IBM hackathons and interactive ask me anything sessions to provide you with the most enriching learning experience. Elevate your data engineering skills and career prospects today. For admission to this data engineering course, a bachelor's degree with an average of 50% or higher marks is required, a 2 plus years of work experience is preferred, and basic understanding of object oriented programming is preferred. So enroll now. This lesson focuses on Hive. Let us explore the objectives of this lesson in the next screen. By the end of this lesson, you will be able to describe Hive and its importance, explain Hive architecture and its various components, identify installation and configuration steps for Hive, describe the basics of Hive programming. In the next screen, we will discuss the need for an additional data warehousing system. Anyone who owned and operated a web application would be familiar with the problem of the storing and retrieval of data being generated every minute. The adaptive solution created for the same was the use of Hadoop, including the Hadoop Distributed File System, or HDFS, for performing operations on data for storage and retrieval. The Hadoop framework has a scalable and highly accessible architecture. Another problem that cropped up further in the process was that some data could not be expressed. It was difficult to develop a map reduce program for expressing the data. 
the solution was Hive. In the next screen we will discuss the basics of Hive. Hive is defined as a data warehouse system for Hadoop that facilitates ad hoc queries and the analysis of large data sets stored in Hadoop. It provides a SQL-like language called HiveQL or HQL. Due to its SQL-like interface, Hive is a popular choice for Hadoop analytics. It provides massive scale-out and fault tolerance capabilities for data storage and processing of commodity hardware. Relying on MapReduce for execution, Hive is batch-oriented and has high latency for query execution. In the next screen, we will discuss the key characteristics of Hive. Hive is a system for managing and querying unstructured data into a structured format. It uses the concept of MapReduce for the execution of its scripts and HDFS for storage and retrieval of data. Following are the key principles underlying Hive. Hive commands are similar to that of SQL. SQL is a data warehousing tool that is similar to Hive. Hence, learning Hive will not be a big challenge for those who are familiar with SQL. Hive contains extensive pluggable MapReduce scripts in the language of your choice. These scripts include rich user-defined data types and user-defined functions. Hive has an extensible framework to support different files and data formats. Performance is better in Hive since Hive Engine uses the best inbuilt script to reduce the execution time thus enabling high output in less time. In the next screen, we will discuss the system architecture and the components of Hive. The image on the screen shows the architecture of the Hive system. It also illustrates the role of Hive and Hadoop in the development process. In the next few slides, we will discuss the components of Hive as shown on the screen. We will start with Metastore in the next screen. Metastore is the component that stores the system catalog and metadata about tables, columns, partitions, and so on. Usually, metadata is stored in a traditional RDBMS format. Apache Hive uses Derby Database by default. Any JDBC-compliant database, like MySQL, can be used for Metastore. In the next screen, we will discuss the configuration of Metastore. We will focus on the key attributes that need to be configured for Hive Metastore. The primary attributes that should be configured are Connection URL Connection Driver Connection User ID and Connection Password. Now let us look at the XML file used to configure Metastore. The template of the file displayed on screen may vary from one version of Hive to another. In the next screen, we will focus on Driver. Driver is responsible for managing the lifecycle of an HQL or Hive query language statement as it moves through Hive. The driver also maintains a session handle and session statistics, if any. It includes three basic components, namely the compiler, the optimizer, and the executor. In the next screen, we will focus on the compiler. Query Compiler is one of the driver components. It is responsible for compiling the Hive script for errors. If the script is error-free, it is converted into a directed acyclic graph, or DAG, of MapReduce tasks. In the next screen, we will focus on the Query Optimizer. Query Optimizer optimizes Hive scripts for faster execution of the same. It consists of a chain of transformations, so that the operator DAG resulting from one transformation is passed as an input to the next transformation. A query optimizer also performs tasks like column pruning, partition pruning, and repartitioning of data. In the next screen, we will discuss the role of Execution Engine. The role of Execution Engine is to execute the tasks produced by the compiler in proper dependency order. The execution engine interacts with the underlying Hadoop instance to ensure perfect synchronization with Hadoop services. In the next screen, we will discuss the server components in Hive. Hive Server is the main component responsible for providing a thrift interface to the user. It also maintains connectivity in modules. 
it provides a JDBC or ODBC server. JDBC stands for Java Database Connectivity and ODBC refers to Open Database Connectivity. Hive Server enables the integration of Hive with other applications. In the next screen we will discuss client components. A developer uses client components to perform development in Hive. Some of the client components are Command Line Interface or CLI, Web User Interface or UI, and the JDBC ODBC driver. CLI is the Hive prompt from where you can enter commands and execute the same. Web Interface is a web console to view and interact with Hive. The JDBC ODBC driver is used to interface Hive with the existing database components or engine. In the next screen we will discuss the basics of Hive query language. Hive query language or HQL is the query language for Hive engine. Hive supports basic SQL queries such as the from clause subquery, ANSI joins such as equa join only, multi table insert, multi group by, sampling and objects traversal. HQL provides support to pluggable map reduce scripts using the transform command. In the next screen we will focus on tables in Hive. Hive tables are analogous to tables in relational databases. A Hive table logically comprises the data being stored and the associated metadata. Each table has a corresponding directory in HDFS. There are two types of tables in Hive. They are managed tables and external tables. To create a table in Hive, use the command shown on the screen. Once created, this table can be located in HDFS in a directory mentioned on the screen. In the next screen, we will focus on external tables. External tables are Hive entities that are similar to tables. The difference is that when a table is created, the unstructured data, which is linked to this table, is deleted. In external tables, however, unstructured data is copied and not deleted. Following are the key considerations in an external table. External table points can be stored in existing data directories in HDFS. External tables can create tables and partitions. In an external table, data is in Hive compatible format. When an external table is dropped, only the metadata drops. Let us consider an example on how to create an external table. The command used to create an external table is called test underscore extern using unstructured data available at the location mentioned on the screen. While the table is created, it is ensured that the data is not deleted. In the next screen we will discuss data types. The data types in Hive are primitive, complex, and user-defined types. Click each box to learn more. Primitive data types include integers such as tiny int, small int, int and big int, boolean, floating point numbers types such as float and double and string. Complex types include structs, maps and arrays. Examples of such types are shown on the screen. User-defined types include structures with attributes that can be of any type. In this screen we will discuss partitions. Partitions are analogous to dense indexes on columns. The features of partitions are that they contain nested subdirectories in HDFS for each combination of partition column values and allow users to retrieve the rows efficiently. An example of a partition is shown on the screen. Let us now focus on how to create a partition in Hive. Certain queries are used to create partitions and insert data in them. Some of these queries are given on the screen. In the next screen, we will discuss serialization and deserialization. Serialization takes a Java object that Hive has been working with and turns it into something that Hive can write to HDFS or another supported system. 
Serialization is used when writing data, for example, through an insert select statement. Deserialization is used during query time to execute select statements. The other facts related to serialization and deserialization are the interface used for performing serialization and deserialization is SIRD. In some situations, the interface used for deserialization is lazy SIRD. This interface allows unstructured data to be converted into structured data due to its flexibility. While using this interface, the data is read based on the separation by different delimiter characters. The SIRD interface is located in the JAR file mentioned on screen. In the next screen, we will explore the file formats in Hive. Hive lets users to store different file formats and helps them to improve the performance with respect to the operations done on data, such as storing, analyzing, and so on. The example given on the screen shows how SQL is used to perform a file format operation in which the sequence file input format class is used for input and the sequence file output format class is used for output. In the next screen, we will focus on Hive queries. One of the queries in Hive is select. The syntax of the select query is shown on the screen. Similar to a relational database, the select query has WHERE, GROUP BY, SORT BY, and LIMIT clauses. The select query also supports nested queries. In the next screen, we will focus on JOIN and INSERT operations. HQL supports JOIN and INSERT commands. Some examples of JOIN and INSERT commands are shown on the screen. In the next screen, we will discuss the installation of Hive. To install Hive, you need to locate the Hive tar file. You will be using Hive version 0.13.1 for your practicals. You can also use the newer versions. You can get the download location by visiting the URL shown in the image here. In the next screen, we will download the Hive tar file and untar the same. Use the wget command to download the Hive tar file in Ubuntu system. Once the download is complete, you need to extract the Hive tar file. The command for the same is shown on screen. In the next screen, we will continue with the Hive installation process. Move the extracted tar file to the location mentioned on the screen. Use the command displayed on the screen to perform this step of Hive installation. In the next screen, we will set the Hive prefix and the path for Hive. Ensure that you move the Hive folder, which was extracted in the previous step, to the location mentioned on screen. Next, you need to use the command shown in the first image to set the Hive prefix. To set the path for Hive, use the command shown in the second image on the screen. In the next screen, we will discuss how to start the Hive prompt. To start the Hive prompt, use the Hive command and press the Enter button. You will get a prompt similar to the one shown on the screen. Now let us focus on the properties that are set in your Hive system. To know the Hive properties that are set in your machine, use the command set hyphen V. In the next screen, we will discuss how to perform programming in Hive. To show the total number of tables, use the Show Tables command. Ensure all commands end with a semicolon. Initially, you will get an output similar to the one shown on the screen. This is because currently there are no tables in Hive. So let us now create a table in the next screen. Suppose the name of the table is Book, and it has one column called Word. Use the command shown on the screen to create the table. Ensure you complete your query with a semicolon. In the next screen, we will take a look at the output. As discussed earlier, Hive stores a table in the form of a folder. To view the output, browse the Name Node Web UI and look for the directory named User. Under the User directory, you will find a folder named Hive. Under Hive, you will find a folder named Warehouse. In the Warehouse folder, you will find your table named Book. In the next screen, we will load the book from HDFS to the Hive table we have created. There is no content in the book. Let us now add some content from unstructured data. 
ensure that you have the War and Peace book uploaded to HDFS. In the next screen we will focus on the command used for this purpose. The command shown on the screen will help to load the data from HDFS. In the next screen we will check if the table has been successfully created. To verify the same, use the command show tables in Hive prompt. If the listing shows your table, it means that the table has been successfully created. In the next screen, we will continue to focus on programming in Hive. Let us check the table schema in Hive using the command shown on screen. In the next screen, we will discuss how to check the content of the table. Use the command given on the screen to check the content present in the table. You will get the output as words. In the next screen, we will focus on the extensibility of Hive query language. Use the command given on the screen to check the content present in the table. You will get the output as words. In the next screen, we will focus on the extensibility of Hive query language. The Hive query language can be extended in multiple ways. Some of the common ways include pluggable user-defined functions, pluggable map reduce scripts, pluggable user-defined types, and pluggable data formats. In the next screen, we will focus on user-defined function. Hive has the ability to define a function. Any new user-defined or UDF class needs to inherit from this UDF class. All UDF classes need to implement one or more methods named evaluate, which will be called by Hive. Evaluate should never be a void method, however it can return null if needed. After compiling UDF, you have to include it in the Hive class path. Then, once Hive gets started, you have to register the function. Next, you use the function in a Hive query statement. In the next screen, we will focus on built-in functions. Hive provides a lot of built-in functions such as mathematical, collection, type conversion, date, conditional, and string. In the next slide, we will focus on other functions in Hive. There are various other functions in Hive, namely aggregate function, table generating function, and so on. Aggregate functions create the output if the full set of data is given. The implementation of this function is a little complex compared to that of the UDF. The user has to implement a few more methods, but the idea is similar. Therefore, Hive provides a lot of built-in user-defined aggregate functions, also known as UDAF. Normal user-defined functions, namely CONCAT, take in a single input row and output a single output row. In contrast, table-generating functions transform a single input row to multiple output rows. Lateral view is used in conjunction with table-generating functions. An SQL script for lateral view is given on the screen. Consider the base table named Page Ads. It has two columns, namely Page ID, that is the name of the page, and Ad ID List, that is an array of ads appearing on the page. A lateral view with Explode can be used to convert Ad ID List into separate rows using the query given on screen. In the next screen, we will focus on MapReduce scripts. MapReduce scripts can be written in scripting languages like Python. Users can plug in their own custom mappers and reducers in the data stream. To run a custom mapper script and a custom reducer script, the user can issue a command which uses the transform clause to embed the mapper and the reducer scripts. For example, in the script shown on the screen, by default, key value pairs will be transformed to string and delimited by tab before feeding to the user script. The method strip returns a copy of all the words in which whitespace characters have been stripped from the beginning and the end of the word. The method split returns a list of all the words using tab as the separator. In the next screen, we will focus on the comparison of UDF and UDAF with MapReduce scripts. User-defined functions are written in Java, while MapReduce scripts can be written in any language. Both user-defined functions and MapReduce scripts support one-to-one, -one, end to one and one-to-n input-to-output. However, user-defined functions are much faster than MapReduce scripts 
since the latter spawns new processes for different operations. In the next screen we will focus on a business scenario. Olivia is the EVP IT Operations at Nutra Worldwide Incorporated. Clive is the AVP Business Interface. Clive is assigned to one of Olivia's projects. He has been asked to analyze the distribution data at Nutra Worldwide Incorporated. As part of this assignment, he has to perform advanced data analytics. Clive wants to install Hive so that he can perform data analytics. The demos in this lesson will illustrate how to install Hive and perform data analytics and partitioning. We will start with the first demo in the next screen. In this demo, we will perform installation of Hive on Ubuntu system. Visit the website www.hive.apache.org. Click the downloads link http colon double slash hive.apache.org slash downloads dot html. Click on download a release now link http colon double slash hive dot apache dot org slash dyn slash closer dot cgl slash hive slash click the mirror link http colon double slash mirror dot tcpdiag dot net slash apache slash hive slash Click Hive version 0.11.0 .1 file. Right click the Hive 0.11.0 tar file. Click on Copy Link Location Menu item. Access the server shell prompt and download Hive. The command is WGET followed by the link mentioned on the screen. Once downloaded, you will need to uncompress the folder. This is done using the command shown on the screen. Copy the extracted folder to the desired location. Use the command shown on the screen. The next step is to install Java. Type the command shown on the screen and press the Enter key to continue. Now let us set the bash. To do so, use the command shown on the screen. Scroll down and ensure you add the lines as highlighted in the screenshot. They are export hive underscore prefix equals slash USR slash local slash hive and export path equals dollar path colon dollar hive prefix underscore slash bin. If you see an output as shown in the screenshot, it means that Java has been installed and configured successfully. Update the bash using the exec bash command. Ensure that Hadoop services are active. This can be done using the command jps. To start Hive, the command is Hive you will get a Hive prompt where the queries are run. Congratulations! You have now successfully installed and configured Hive. Let us do a quick recap of the steps performed.
In this demo, we will demonstrate advanced data analytics using Hive. For example, let us create a table called book with one field of data type string. The command used is shown on the screen. Press Enter key to continue. Observe row format delimited. Press Enter key to continue. Observe fields terminated by single quotes. Press Enter key to continue. Observe lines terminated by slash and press the Enter key. Now let us load the data from the file into the table. The command to load data is shown on the screen. Press Enter key to continue. Let us verify the table by listing the same. The command is show tables semicolon. Press Enter key to continue. The highlighted part shows our table book. Let us verify the schema of the table book. The command is describe book semicolon. Press Enter key to continue. The output describes the table book. Type select lower open bracket word close bracket comma count open bracket asterisk close bracket as count and press enter key. Observe from book and press enter key. Observe where Lower open bracket substring open bracket word comma one comma three close bracket close bracket equals start single quote was end single quote. Press enter key. Observe group by word and press enter key. Observe having count as greater than 50. Press Enter key. Observe sort by count DESC semicolon. Press Enter key to start the execution process of the query. Observe the job execution. Observe the output. It shows the occurrence of the word was, which is 366. Congratulations, you have now successfully executed the program. Let us do a quick recap of the steps performed. Let us look at the word count demo using Hive. To begin with, launch Hive on your system. Create a table named Book with a single column, text word, to store the contents. In this case, we will put all the contents of the table in a single column and do further transformation and querying. Use the syntax shown on the screen. The fields are terminated by slash n since we are using a new line character as a delimiter to read each line. The file is saved in the text file format. The table book will be created once you press enter after semicolon on Hive prompt. 
Load the book Gutenberg.txt from the HDFS path. Use the syntax shown on the screen. Use the command shown on the screen. Enter semicolon and press enter. The contents get uploaded in the table book in Hive Warehouse. Query the table for determining a word count by using the SELECT statement. Use the SELECT query with the COUNT operator. Use lateral view and user-defined functions to split the contents into space-separated words. A lateral view first applies the user-defined function to each row of the base table and then joins the resulting output rows to the input rows to form a virtual table having the supplied table alias. To put it simply, this line will put each word on a separate record of lateral view. Now group by word so that the count operator can give the result by each distinct word. Execute the query and observe the result with each word showing the count of times it occurs in the document. In this demo, we will use a document from the Document Management System of Nutra Worldwide Incorporated and demonstrate how to determine word count using Hive. Let us do a quick recap of the steps performed. In this demo, we will demonstrate partitioning with Hive. Let us look at table partitions using Hive. To begin with, launch Hive on your system. Create a table president. Mention the two columns, SNO, which means serial number and line, which includes the president name per line. Partition by the parameter country, which is of type string. Note, we have not mentioned country as a column in the table unlike we do in most of the relational databases. Use the usual Hive syntax row format delimited. The fields are terminated by a comma since the data is comma separated. Execute the query and use the describe command to verify if the table is created as per the requirement. You will observe that the table has been created successfully. Let us now load data in the table. Load data in the table president using the load data in path command since the data is already present in HDFS. You will observe an error if the partition is not specified. The reason for the error is that we did not specify the partition in which data is to be loaded. Let us try to rectify the error by using the clause partition country equals USA to ensure that data gets loaded in the right partition of the table. You will observe that query has been successfully executed. Let us check the data in HDFS to see how Hive tables and partitions are created. From the Hive prompt itself, use the command shown on the screen to view the table directory. Please note that the directory location may vary with Hive and Hadoop distribution version. List the directory for the partition country equals USA partition. Note that a directory is created for the table president. A directory is also created for the partition country equals USA. Let us now load the data for some other countries also. Let us load the data for the partition country equals India. Now load the data for the partition country equals Russia. Check how the various partitions have been created in HDFS. Use the DFS minus 
ls command again from the hive prompt you will observe that a directory for each partition has been created you can list the content of each directory to view the data files present in every partition directory let us do a quick recap of the steps performed Let us summarize the topics covered in this lesson. Hive is a system for managing and querying unstructured data into a structured format. The various components of Hive architecture are Metastore, Driver, Execution, Engine, and so on. Metastore is a component that stores the system catalog and metadata about tables, columns, partitions, and so on. Hive installation starts with locating the latest version of tar file and downloading it in Ubuntu system using the wget command. While programming in Hive, use the show tables command to display the total number of tables. So if you are interested in mastering the world of data engineering, look no further than our postgraduate program in data engineering. This comprehensive course is tailor-made for professionals like you Diving deep into the essential topics such as Hadoop framework, Spark-based data processing, Kafka-driven data pipelines, and the intricacies of managing big data on AWS and Azure cloud infrastructures. A unique approach blends live session, hands-on industry projects, exciting IBM hackathons, and interactive Ask Me Anything sessions to provide you with the most enriching learning experience. Elevate your data engineering skills and career prospects today. For admission to this data engineering course, a bachelor's degree with an average of 50% or higher marks is required, a 2 plus years of work experience is preferred, and basic understanding of object-oriented programming is preferred. So enroll now. Difference between Hive and RDBMS. Remember, RDBMS stands for the Relational Database Management System. Let's take a look at the difference between Hive and the RDBMS. With Hive, Hive enforces schema on read. And it's very important that whatever's coming in, that's when Hive's looking at it and making sure that it fits the model. Um, the RDBMS enforces a schema when it actually writes the data into the database. So it's read the data, and then once it starts to write it, that's where it's going to give you the error or tell you something's incorrect about your scheme. Hive data size is in petabytes. That is hard to imagine. Um, you know, when we're looking at your personal computer on your desk, maybe you have 10 terabytes if it's a high-end computer. But we're talking petabytes, so that's hundreds of computers grouped together. When a RDBMS, data size is in terabytes. Very rarely do you see an RDBMS system that's spread over more than five computers. And there's a lot of reasons for that. With the RDBMS, it actually has um, a high end amount of writes to the hard drive. There's a lot more going on there. You're writing and pulling stuff. So you really don't want to get too big with an RDBMS or you're going to run into a lot of problems. With Hive, you can take it as big as you want. Hive is based on the notion of write once and read many times. This is so important. Uh, they call it WORM, which is write, W, once, O, read, R, many times, M. They refer to it as WORM, and that's true of any of you, a lot of your Hadoop setup. It's, it's altered a little bit, but in general, we're looking at archiving data that you want to do data analysis on. We're looking at pulling all that stuff off your RDBMS from years and years and years of business or whatever your company does or scientific research and putting that into a huge data pool so that you can now do queries on it and get that information out of it. With the RDBMS, it's based on the notion of read and write many times. Uh, so you're continually updating this database. You're continually bringing up new stuff, new sales. The count changes because they have a different licensing now, whatever software you're selling, all that kind of stuff where the data is continually fluctuating. And then Hive resembles a traditional database by supporting SQL, but it is not a database. It is a data 
warehouse. This is very important and it goes with all the other stuff we've talked about that we're not looking at a database but a data warehouse to store the data and still have fast and easy access to it for doing queries. Um, you can think of um, Twitter and Facebook. They have so many posts that are archived back historically, um, those posts aren't going to change. They made the post, they're posted, they're there, and they're in their database, but they have to store it in a warehouse in case they want to pull it back up. With the RDBMS, it's a type of database management system which is based on the relational model of data. And then with Hive, easily scalable at a low cost. Again, we're talking maybe $1,000 per terabyte. Um, the RDBMS is not scalable at a low cost. When you first start on the lower end, you're talking about 10000 per terabyte of data, including all the backup on the models and, and all the added necessities to support it. As you scale it up, you have to scale those computers and hardware up. Uh, so you might start off with a basic server, and then you upgrade to a Sun computer to run it, uh, and you spend you know tens of thousands of dollars for that hardware upgrade. With Hive, you just put another computer into your Hadoop file system. So let's look at some of the features of Hive. Uh, when we're looking at the features of Hive, we're talking about the use of SQL-like language called HiveQL. A lot of times you'll see that as HQL, which is easier than long codes. This is nice if you're working with your shareholders. You come to them and you say, hey, you can do a basic SQL query on here and pull up the information you need. This way, you don't have to take off, have your programmers jump in every time they want to look up something in the database. They actually now can easily do that if they're not uh, skilled in programming and script writing. Tables are used, which are similar to the RDBMS. Hence, easier to understand. And um, one of the things I like about this is when I'm bringing tables in from a MySQL server or SQL server, there's almost a direct reflection between the two. So when you're looking at one, which is a data which is continually changing, and then you're going into the archive database, it's not this huge jump where you have to learn a whole new language. Uh, you mirror that same schema into the HDFS, into the Hive, uh, making it very easy to go between the two. And then using Hive QL, multiple users can simultaneously query data. Uh, so again, you can have multiple clients in there and they send in their query. That's also true with the RDBMS, which kind of queues them up because it's running so fast you don't notice the um, lag time. Well, you get that also with the HQL. As you add more computers in, the query can go very quickly depending on how many computers and how much um, resources each machine has to pull the information. And Hive supports a variety of data types. Uh, so with Hive, it's designed to be on the Hadoop system, which you can put almost anything into the Hadoop file system. So with all that, let's take a look at a demo on Hive QL or HQL. Before I dive into the hands-on demo, let's take a look at the website, hive.apache.org. That's the main website uh, since Apache. It's an Apache open source uh, software. This is the main software for, or the main site for the build. And if you go in here, you'll see that they're slowly migrating Hive into Beehive. And so if you see Beehive versus Hive, uh, note the Beehive is a new release that's coming out. That's all it is. It reflects a lot of the same functionality of Hive. It's the same thing. And then we like to pull up some kind of um, documentation on commands. And for this, I'm actually going to go to Hortonworks Hive Cheat Sheet. And that's because Hortonworks and Cloudera are two of the most common used builds for Hadoop and for which include Hive and all the different tools in there. And so Hortonworks has a pretty good PDF you can download cheat sheet on there. I believe Cloudera does too. But we'll go ahead and just look at the Horton one because it's the one that comes up really good. And you can see when we look at the query language, it compares MySQL server to HiveQL or HQL. And you can see the basic select. We select from columns, uh, from table, where conditions exist. You know, most basic uh, command on there. And they have different things you can do with it, just like you do with your uh, SQL. And if you scroll down, you'll see um, data types. So here's your integer, your flow, your binary, double string, timestamp, and all the different data types you can use. Some different semantics different keys, features, functions uh, for running a Hive query, command line setup, and of course the Hive shell uh, setup in here. Uh, so you can see right here if we loop through it, it has a lot of your basic stuff. And it, it's, we're basically looking at SQL across a Horton database. We're going to go ahead and run our uh, Hadoop cluster Hive uh, demo. And I'm going to go ahead and use the Cloudera Quick Start. And this is in the virtual box. So again, we have an Oracle virtual box, which is open source. And then we have our Cloudera Quick Start, which is the Hadoop set up on a single node. Now, obviously, Hadoop and Hive are designed to run across a cluster of computers. So when we talk 
talking about a single note is for education, testing, that kind of thing. And if you have a chance, you can always go back and look at our demo we had on um, setting up a Hadoop system in a single cluster. Just set a note down below in the YouTube video, and our team will get in contact with you and send you that link if you don't already have it. Or you can contact us at the www.simplylearn.com. Now in here, it's always important to note that you do need um, on your computer, if you're running on Windows, because I'm on a Windows machine, you're going to need a, probably about 12 gigabytes to actually run this. Uh, it used to be you could buy with a lot less, but as things have evolved, they take up more and more resources. And you need the professional version. If you have the home version, I was able to get that to run, but boy, did it take a lot of extra work to get the home version to let me use the virtual setup on there. And we'll simply click on the Cloudera Quick Start, and I'm going to go ahead and just start that up. And this is starting up our Linux. So we have have our Windows 10 which is a computer I'm on and then I have the virtual box which is going to have a Linux operating system in it and we'll skip ahead so you don't have to watch the whole install something interesting to know about the Cloudera is that it's running on Linux CentOS and for whatever reason I've always had to click on it and hit the escape button for it to spin up and then you'll see the DOS come in here. Now that our Cloudera is spun up on our virtual machine with the Linux on, uh, we can see here we have our, uh, it uses the uh, Thunderbird browser on here by default and automatically opens up a number of different tabs for us. And a quick note, because I mentioned like the restrictions on getting set up on your own computer. If you have a home edition computer and you're worried about setting it up on there, you can also go in there and spin up a uh, one month free service on Amazon Web Service to play with this. Uh, so there's other options. You're not stuck with just doing it on the quick start menu. You can spin this up in many other ways. Now the first thing we want to note is that we've come in here into Cloudera and I'm going to access this in two ways. Uh, the first one is we're going to use Hue. And I'm going to open up Hue and it'll take it a moment to load from um, the setup on here. And Hue is nice. If I go in and use Hue as an editor into Hive or into the Hadoop setup, usually I'm doing it as a um, from an admin side because it has a lot more information, a lot of visuals, less to do with you know actually diving in there and just executing code. And you can also write this code into files and scripts, and there's other things you can other ways you can upload it into Hive. But today we're going to look at the command lines, and we'll upload it into Hue, and then we'll go into and actually do our work. In in a terminal window under the Hive shell. Now in the Hue browser window, if you go under Query and click on the pull down menu, and then you go under Editor, and you'll see Hive. There we go. There's our Hive setup. I go and click on Hive, and this will open up our query down here, and now it has a nice little B that shows our Hive going, and we can go uh, something very simple down here like Show Databases, and we follow it with the semicolon. And that's the standard in Hive, is you always add our uh, uh, punctuation at the end there. And I'll go ahead and run this, and the query will show up underneath. And you'll see down here, uh, since this is a new quick start I just put on here, you'll see it has the default down here for uh, the databases. That's the database name. I haven't actually created any databases on here. And then there's a lot of other like uh, assistant function, tables, um, your databases up here. There's all kinds of things you can research, you can look at through Hue as far as uh, a bigger picture. The downside of this is it always seems to lag. For me, whenever I'm doing this, I always seem to run slow. So if you're in Cloudera, you can open up a terminal window. They actually have an icon at the top. You can also go under Applications, and under Applications, System Tools, and Terminal. Either one will work. It's just a regular terminal window. And this terminal window is now running underneath our Linux. So this is a Linux terminal window, or on our virtual machine, which is resting on our regular Windows 10 machine. And we'll go ahead and zoom this in so you can see the text better on your own video. And I simply just clicked on View and Zoom In. And then all we have to do is type in Hive. And this will open up the shell on here. And it takes it just a moment to load. When starting up Hive, I also want to note that depending on your rights on the computer you're on in your action, you might have to do sudo Hive and put in your password and username. Most computers are usually set up with the Hive login. Again, it just depends on how you're accessing the Linux system and the Hive shell. Once we're in here, we can go ahead and do a simple uh, HQL command, show databases. And if we do that, we'll see here that we don't have any databases. So we can go ahead and create a database. I will just call it Office for today, for this moment. Now if I do Show, we'll just do the up arrow. 
Up arrow is a hotkey that works in both Linux and in Hive, so I can go back and paste through all the commands I've typed in. And we can see now that I have my, uh, there's of the course a default database, and then there's the Office database. So now we've created a database. It's pretty quick and easy. And we can go ahead and drop the database. We can do drop database office. Now this will work on this database because it's empty. If your database was not empty, you would have to do cascade. And that drops all the tables in the database and the database itself. Now if we do show database, and we'll go ahead and recreate our database because we're going to use the office database for the rest of this um, hands-on demo. A really handy command to now uh, set with the um, SQL or HQL is to use office. And what that does is that sets office as the default database. So instead of having to reference the database every time we work with a table, it now automatically assumes that's the database being used whatever tables we're working on. The difference is, is you put the database name period table. And I'll show you in just a minute what that looks like and how that's different. If we're going to have a table and a database, we should probably load some data into it. So let me go ahead and switch gears here and open up a terminal window. You can just open another terminal window and it'll open up right on top of the one that you have Hive Shell running in. And when we're in this terminal window, first we're going to go ahead and just do a list, which is of course a Linux command. You can see all the files I have in here. This is the default load. We can change directory to documents. We can list in documents, and we're actually going to be looking at employee.csv. A Linux command is the cat. And you can use this actually to combine documents. There's all kinds of things that cat does. But if we want to just display the um, contents of our employee.csv file, we can simply do cat employee csv. And when we're looking at this, we want to know a couple things. One, there's a line at the top. Okay, so the very first thing we notice is that we have a header line. The next thing we notice is that that the data is comma separated and in this particular case you'll see a space here generally with these you got to be real careful with spaces there's all kinds of things you got to watch out for because they can cause issues these spaces won't because these are all strings that the space is connected to if this was a space next to the integer you would get a null value that comes into the database without doing something extra in there now with most of Hadoop that's important to know that you're writing the data once reading it many times and that's true of almost all your Hadoop things coming in, so you really want to process the data before it gets into the database. And for those who of you have studied uh, data transformation, that's the ADL, where you extract, transfer, form, and then load the data. So you really want to extract and transform before putting it into the hive. Then you load it into the hive with the transformed data. And of course, we also want to note the schema. We have an integer, string, string, integer, integer. Uh, so we kept it pretty simple in here as far as the way the data is set up. The last thing that you're going to want to look up uh, when you're, is the source. Uh, since we're doing local uploads, we want to know what the path is. We have the whole path. In this case, it's home slash cloudera slash documents. And these are just text documents we're working with right now. We're not doing anything fancy. So we can do a simple get edit employee.csv and you'll see it comes up here. Uh, it's just a text document so I can easily remove these added spaces. There we go. Um, and then we go ahead and just save it. And so now it has the new setup in there. We've edited it. The gedit is usually one of the default that loads into Linux. Um, so any text editor will do. Back to the Hive shell. So let's go ahead and create a table employee. And what I want you to note here is I did not put the semicolon on the end here. A semicolon tells it to execute that line. So this is kind of nice if you're, you can actually just paste it in if you have it written on another sheet. And you can see right here where I have create table employee and it goes into the next line on there so I can do all of my commands at once. Now just so I don't have any typo errors I went ahead and just pasted the next three lines in and the next one is our schema. If you remember correctly from the other side we had uh, the different values in here which was ID, name, department, year of joining, and salary. And the ID is an integer, name is a string, department string, year of joining, integer, salary, an integer. And they're in brackets. We put closed brackets around them. And you could do this all as one line. And then we have row format delimited fields terminated by comma. And this is important because the default is tabs. So if I do it now, it won't find any terminated fields. So you'll get a bunch of null values loaded into your table. And then finally, our table properties, we want to skip the header line count equals one. 
Now, this is a lot of work for uploading a single file. It's kind of goofy when you're uploading a single file that you have to put all this in here. But keep in mind, Hive and Hadoop is designed for writing many files into the database. You write them all in there, and then you can they're saved. It's an archive. It's a data warehouse. And then you're able to do all your queries on them. So a lot of times, we're not looking at just the one file coming up. We're loading hundreds of files. You have your reports coming off of your main database. All those reports are being loaded. You have your log files, you have, I mean, all this different data is being dumped into Hadoop, and in this case, Hive on top of Hadoop. And so we need to let it know, hey, how do I handle these files coming in? And then we have the semicolon at the end, which lets us know to go ahead and run this line. And so we'll go ahead and run that. And now if we do a show tables, uh, you can see there's our employee on there. We can also describe. If we do describe employee, uh, you can see that we have our ID integer, name string, department string, year of uh, joining integer, and salary integer. And then finally, let's just do a select star from employee, very basic um, SQL and HQL command, uh, selecting data. It's going to come up, and we haven't put anything in it, so as we expect, there's no data in it. So if we flip back to our um, Linux terminal window, you can see where we did the cat employee.csv, and you can see all the data we expect to come into it. And we also did our PWD, and right here you see the path. You need that full path when you are um, loading data. You know, you can do a browse, and if I did it right now with just the employee.csv as a name, it will work. But that is a really bad habit in general when you're loading data because it's uh, you don't know what else is going on in the computer. You want to do the full path almost in all your data loads. So let's go ahead and flip back over here to our um, Hive shell we're working in. And the command for this is load data. Uh, so that says, hey, we're loading data. That's a Hive command, HQL. And we want local data. So you got to put down local in path. So now it needs to know where the path is. Now, to make this more legible, I'm just going to go ahead and hit enter. And then we'll just paste the full path in there, which I have um, stored over on the side, like a good prepared prepared um, demo. And you'll see here we have home, Cloudera, documents, employee.csv. So it's a whole path for this text document in here. And we go ahead and hit enter in there. And then we have to let it know where the data is going. So now we have a source and we need a destination. And it's going to go into the table and we'll just call it employee. We'll just match the table in there. And because I want it to execute, we put the semicolon on the end, it goes ahead and executes all three lines. Now if we go back, if you remember we did the select star from employee, just using the up arrow to page through my different um, commands I've already typed in. You can see right here we have, uh, as we expect, we have Rose, Sam, Mike, and Nick, and we have all their information showing in our four rows. And then let's go ahead and do uh, select and count. We'll just look at a couple of these different select options you can do. We're going to count everything from employee. Now this is kind of interesting because the first one just pops up with a basic uh, select because it doesn't need to go through the full map reduce phase. But when you start doing a count, it does go through the full map reduce setup in the Hive and Hadoop. And because I'm doing this demo on a single node Cloudera virtual box on top of a Windows 10, all the benefits of running it on a cluster are gone and instead it's now going through all those added layers so it takes longer to run. You know, like I said, uh, when you do a single node, as I said earlier, it doesn't do any good as an actual distribution because you're only running it on one computer and then you've added all these different layers to run it. And we see it comes up with four and that's what we expect. We have four rows, we expect four at the end. And if you remember from uh, our cheat sheet, which we brought up here from Horton, so it's a pretty good one, there's all these different commands we can do. We'll look at one more command where we do the uh, uh, what they call subqueries right down here, because uh, that's really common to do a lot of subqueries. And so we'll do select uh, star or all different columns from employee. Now if we weren't using the office database, it would look like this, from office.employee. And either one will work on this particular one because um, we have office set as a default on there. Uh, so from office employee and then the command where creates a subset and in this case we want to know where the salary is greater than 25 
1,000. There we go. And of course, we end with our semicolon. And if we run this query, you can see it pops up, and there's our salaries of people, top earners. Uh, we have Rose and IT and Mike and HR. Uh, kudos to them. Of course, they're fictional. I don't actually, we don't actually have a Rose and a Mike in those positions, or maybe we do. So finally, we want to go ahead and do is we're done with this um, table. Now, remember, you're dealing with a data warehouse, so you usually don't do a lot of dropping of tables and databases. But we're going to go ahead and drop this table here. Before we drop it, one more quick note is we can change it. So what we're going to do is we're going to alter table office employee and we want to go ahead and rename it. There's some other commands you can do in here but rename is pretty common and we're going to rename it to and it's going to stay in office and uh, it turns out one of our shareholders really doesn't like the word employee. He wants employees plural. It's a big deal to him. So let's go ahead and change that name for the table. It's that easy because it's just changing the metadata on there. And now if we do show tables, you'll see we now have employees, not employee. Uh, and then at this point, maybe we're doing some house cleaning because this is all practice. So we're going to go ahead and drop table and we'll drop table employees because we change the name in there. So if we did employee, you just give us an error. And now if we do show tables, you'll see all the tables are gone. Now the next thing we want to go ahead and take a look at, and we're going to walk back through the loading of data uh, just real quick because we're going to load two tables in here. And let me just float back to our terminal window so we can see what those tables are that we're loading. And so up here we have customer, we have a customer um, file and we have an order file. We want to go ahead and put the customers and the orders into here. So those are the two we're doing. And of course, course it's always nice to see what you're working with. Uh, so let's do our cat customer.csv. We could always do gedit, but we don't really need to edit these. We just want to take a look at the data in customer. And important in here is again we have a header, so we have to skip a line, comma separated. Uh, nothing odd with the data. We have our schema, which is um, integer, string, integer, string, integer. So you know you'd want to take that, note that down, or flip back and forth when you're doing it. And then let's go ahead and do cat order csv and we can see we have oid which i'm guessing is the order id we have a date up oh, something new we've done integers and strings but we haven't done date when you're importing new and you never worked with the date dates always one of the more trickier fields to port in and that's true of just about any scripting language i've worked with all of them have their own idea of how date's supposed to be formatted what the default is this particular format where it's year and it has all four uh, digits dash month two digits dash day is the standard import for the hive so if you'll have to look up and see what the different formats are if you're going to do a different format in there coming in or you're not able to pre-process the data but this would be a pre-processing of the data thing coming in if you remember correctly from uh, our edl which is uh, e just in case you weren't able to hear me last time etl which stands for extract transform then load so you want to make sure you're transforming this data before it gets into here and so we're going to go ahead and bring um, both this data in here and really we're doing this so we can show you the basic join there is if you remember from our setup merge join all kinds of different things you can do but joining different data sets is, is so common so it's really important to know how to do this we need to go ahead and bring in these two data sets and you can see where I just created a table customer here's our schema the integer name age address salary here's our delimited by commas and our table properties where we skip a line well let's go ahead and load the data first and then we'll do that with our order and let's go ahead and put that in here and I've got it split into three lines so you can see it easily we got load data local in path so we know we're loading data we know it's local and we have the path here's the complete path for um, oops this is supposed to be order CSV grab the wrong one uh, of course it's going to give me errors because you can't recreate the same table on there and here we go create table here's our um, integer date customer the basic setup that we had coming in here for our schema row format commas table properties skip header line and then finally let's load the data into our order table. Load data local in path home Cloudera documents order.csv into table order. Now if we did everything right we should be able to do select star from customer and you can see we have all seven customers and then we can do select star from order and we have uh, four orders uh, so this is just like a quick frame we have you know a lot of times when you have your customer databases in business you have thousands of customers from years and years and some of them you know they move they close their business they change names all 
kinds of things happen. Uh, so what we want to do is we want to go ahead and find just the information connected to these orders and who's connected to them. And so let's go ahead and do, it's a select, because we're going to display uh, information. So select, and this is kind of interesting. We're going to do c.id, um, and I'm going to define c as customer, as a customer table in just a minute. Then we're going to do c.name, and again we're going to define the c c.age. So this means from the customer we want to know their ID, their name, their age, and then you know I'd also like to know the order amount. Uh, so let's do O for dot amount. And then this is where we need to go ahead and define uh, what we're doing. And I'll go ahead and capitalize from customer. So we're going to take the customer table in here and we're going to name it C. That's where the C comes from. So that's the customer table C and we want to join order as O. That's where our O comes from. So the O dot amount is what we're joining in there. And then we want to do this on, we got to tell it how to connect the two tables. C dot ID equals O dot customer underscore ID. So now we know how they're joined. And now remember we have seven customers in here. We have four orders and as it processes we should get a return of four different names joined together. And they're joined based on of course the orders on there. And once we're done, we now have the order number, the person who made the order, their age, and the amount of the order, which came from the order table. Uh, so you have your, your different information. And you can see how the join works here. Very common use of tables in HQL and SQL. And let's do one more thing with our database, and then I'll show you a couple other Hive commands. And let's go ahead and do a drop, and we're going to drop database office. And if you're looking at this and you uh, remember from earlier, this will give me an error. And let's just see what that looks like. It says failed to execute exception. One or more tables exist. So if you remember from before, you can't just drop a database unless you tell it to cascade. That lets it know, I don't care how many tables are in it, let's get rid of it. And in Hadoop, since it's, an, an, it's a warehouse, a data warehouse, you usually don't do a lot of dropping. Uh, maybe at the beginning when you're developing the schemas and you realize you messed up, you might drop some stuff. Uh, but down the road, you're really just adding commodity machines to take up so you can store more stuff on it. So you usually don't do a lot of database dropping. And some other uh, fun commands to know is you can do um, select round 2.3 as round value. You can do a round off in uh, Hive. Uh, we can do as floor value, which is going to give us a 2. So it turns it into an integer versus a float. It goes down, you know, basically truncates it, uh, but it goes down. And we can also do ceiling, which is going to round it up. So we're looking for the next integer above. There's a few commands we didn't show in here because we're on a single node. As, as an admin to help speediate the process, you usually add in partitions for the data and buckets. Um, you can't do that on a single node because the, the um, when you add a partition, it partitions it across separate nodes. But beyond that, you can see that it's very straightforward. We have SQL coming in, uh, and all your basic queries that are in SQL are very similar to HQL. Let's get started with pig. Why pig? What is pig? map reduce versus hive versus pig. Hopefully you've had a chance to do our hive tutorial and our map reduce tutorial. If you haven't, send a note over to Simply Learn and we'll follow up with a link to you. We'll look at pig architecture, working of pig, pig latin data model, pig execution modes, a use case Twitter, and features of pig. And then we'll tag on a short demo so you can see pig in action. So why pig? As we all know, Hadoop uses MapReduce to analyze and process big data. Processing big data consumed more time. So before we had the Hadoop system, they'd have to spend a lot of money on a huge set of computers and enterprise machines. So we introduced the Hadoop MapReduce. And so afterwards, processing big data was faster using MapReduce. Then what is the problem with MapReduce? Prior to 2006, all MapReduce programs were written in Java. Non-programmers found it difficult to write lengthy Java codes. They faced issues in incorporating map sort reduce to fundamentals of map reduce while creating a program. You can see here map phase shuffle and sort reduce phase. Eventually it became a difficult task to maintain and optimize a code due to which the processing time increased. You can imagine a manager trying to go in there 
he needed a simple query to find out data, and he has to go talk to the programmers anytime he wants anything. So that was a big problem. Not everybody wants to have an on-call programmer for every manager on their team. Yahoo faced problems to process and analyze large data sets using Java as the codes were complex and lengthy. There was a necessity to develop an easier way to analyze large data sets without using time-consuming complex Java modes and codes and scripts and all that fun stuff. Apache Pig was developed by Yahoo. It was developed with the vision to analyze and process large data sets without using complex Java codes. Pig was developed especially for non-programmers. Pig used simple steps to analyze data sets, which was time efficient. So what exactly is Pig? Pig is a scripting platform that runs on Hadoop clusters designed to process and analyze large data sets. And so you have your Pig, which uses SQL-like queries. They're definitely not SQL, but some of them resemble SQL queries. And then we use that to analyze our data. Pig operates on various types of data like structured, semi-structured, and unstructured data. Let's take a closer look at MapReduce versus Hive versus Pig. So we start with a compiled language, your MapReduce. And we have Hive, which is your SQL, like query. And then we have Pig, which is a scripting language. It has some similarities to SQL, but it has a lot of its own stuff. Remember, SQL, like query, which is what Hive is based off, looks for structured data. And so when we get into scripting languages like PIG, now we're dealing more with semi-structured and even unstructured data. With a Hadoop map reduce, we have a need to write long, complex codes. With Hive, no need to write complex codes. You could just put it in a simple SQL query or HQL, HiveQL. And in PIG, no need to write complex codes as we have PIG Latin. Now remember in the MapReduce, it can produce structured, semi-structured, and unstructured data. And as I mentioned before, Hive can process only structured data. Think rows and columns. Where PIG can process structured, semi-structured, and unstructured data. You can think of structured data as rows and columns, semi-structured as your HTML, XML documents like you have on your web pages, and unstructured could be anything from groups of documents and written format, Twitter, tweets, any of those things come in as very unstructured data. And with our Hadoop map reduce, we have a lower level of abstraction. With both Hive and Pig, we have a higher level of abstraction. So it's much more easy for someone to use without having to dive in deep and write a very lengthy map reduce code. And those map and reduce codes can take 70, 80 lines of code when you can do the same thing in one or two lines with Hive or Pig. This is the advantage Pig has over Hive. It can process uh, only structured data in Hive, while in Pig it can process structured, semi-structured, and unstructured data. Some other features to note that separates the uh, different query languages is when we look at Map and Reduce, Map Reduce supports partitioning features, as does Hive. Pig, no concept of partitioning in Pig, so it doesn't support your partitioning feature. Your partitioning features allow you to partition the data in such a way that it can be queried quicker. You're not able to do that in Pig. MapReduce uses Java and Python, while Hive uses an SQL-like query language known as HiveQL or HQL. Pig Latin is used, which is a procedural data flow language. MapReduce is used by programmers, pretty much as straightforward on Java. Hive is used by data analysts. Pig is used by researchers and programmers. Certainly there's a lot of mix between all three. Programmers have been known to go in and use a Hive for a quick query, and anybody's been able to use Pig for a quick query or research. Under Map and Reduce, code performance is really good. Under Hive, code performance is lesser than Map and Reduce and Pig. Under Pig, code performance is lesser than Map Reduce, but better than Hive. So if we're going to look at uh, speed and time, the Map Reduce is going to be the fastest performance on all of those, where Pig will have second and Hive follows in the back. Let's look at components of Pig. Pig has two main components. We have Pig Latin. Pig Latin is a procedural data flow language used in Pig to analyze data. It is easy to program using Pig Latin. It is similar to SQL. And then we have the Runtime Engine. Runtime Engine represents the execution environment created to run Pig Latin programs. It is also a compiler that produces MapReduce programs. It uses HDFS, or your Hadoop file system, for storing and retrieving data. And as we dig deeper into the Pig architecture, we'll see that we have Pig Latin scripts. Programmers write a script in Pig Latin to analyze data using Pig. Then you have the Grunt shell, and it actually says Grunt when we start it up, and we'll show you that here in a little bit, which goes into the Pig server, 
and this is where we have our parser. Parser checks the syntax of the pig script. After checking the output will be a DAG, directed acelic graph. And then we have an optimizer, which optimizes um, after your DAG, your logical plan is passed to the logical optimizer where an optimization takes place. Finally, the compiler converts the DAG into MapReduce jobs. And then that is executed on the MapReduce under the execution engine. The results are displayed using dump statement and stored in HDFS using store statement. And again, we'll show you that. Um, they kind of end, you always want to execute everything once you've created it. And so dump is kind of our execution um, statement. And you can see right here, as we were talking about earlier, once we get to the execution engine and it's coded into MapReduce, then the MapReduce processes it onto the HDFS. Working of pig. Pig Latin script is written by the users. So you have load data and write pig script and pig operations. So when we look at the working of pig, pig Latin script is written by the users. There's step one. We load data and write pig script. And step two, in this step, all the pig operations are performed by parser, optimizer, and compiler. So we go into the pig operations. And then we get to step three, execution of the plan. In this stage, the results are shown on the screen, otherwise stored in the HDF as per the code. So it might be of a small amount of data you're reducing it to and you want to put that on the screen or you might uh, be converting a huge amount of data which you want to put back into the Hadoop file system for other use. Let's take a look at the Pig Latin data model. The data model of Pig Latin helps Pig to handle various types of data. For example, we have Adam, Rob, or 50. Adam represents any single value of primitive data type in Pig Latin like integer, float, string. It is stored as a string. Tuple, so we go from our Adam which are our most basic things. So if you look at just Rob or just 50, that's an atom. That's our most basic object we have in Pig Latin. Then you have a tuple. Tuple represents sequence of fields that can be of any data type. It is the same as a row in RDBMS. For example, a set of data from a single row. And you can see here we have Rob, 5. And you can imagine with many of our other examples we've used, you might have uh, the ID number, the name, where they live, their age, their uh, date of starting the job. That would all be one row and stored as a tuple. And then we create a bag. A bag is a collection of tuples. It is the same as a table in RDBMS and is represented by brackets. And you can see here we have our table with Rob5, Mike10. And we also have a map. A map is a set of key value pairs. Key is of character array type and a value can be of any type. It is represented by the brackets. And so we have name and age where the key value is Mike and 10. Pig Latin is a fully nestable data model. That means one data type can be nested within another. Here's a diagram representation of Pig Latin data model. And in this particular example, we have basically an ID number, a name, an age, and a place. And when we break this apart, we look at this model from Pig Latin perspective. Uh, we start with our field. And if you remember, a field contains basically an atom. It is one uh, particular data type. And the atom is stored as a string, which it then converts it into either an integer, or number, or character string. Next we have our tuple, and in this case you can see that it represents a row. So our tuple would be 3, comma, Joe, comma, 29, comma, California. And finally we have our bag, which contains three rows in it in this particular example. Let's take a quick look at pig execution modes. Pig works in two execution modes, depending on where the data is residing and where the pig script is going to run. We have local mode. Here the pig engine takes input from the Linux file system and the output is stored in the same file system. Local mode, local mode is useful in analyzing small data sets using pig. And we have the map reduce mode. Here the pig engine directly interacts and executes in HDFS and map reduce. In the map reduce mode, queries written in pig Latin are translated into map reduce jobs and are run on a Hadoop cluster. By default, pig runs in this mode. There are three modes in pig, depending on how a pig Latin code can be written. We have our interactive mode, batch mode, and embedded mode. The interactive mode means coding and executing the script line by line. When we do our example, we'll be in the interactive mode. In batch mode, all scripts are coded in a file with the extension .pig, and the file is directly executed. And then there's embedded mode. Pig lets its users define their own functions, UDFSs, in a programming language such as Java. So let's take a look and see how this works in a use case, in this case, use case Twitter. Users on Twitter generate about 500 million tweets on a 
daily basis. The Hadoop MapReduce was used to process and analyze this data. Analyzing the number of tweets created by a user in the tweet table was done using MapReduce in Java programming language. And you can see the problem. It was difficult to perform MapReduce operations as users were not well versed with written complex Java codes. So Twitter used Apache Pig to overcome these problems. And let's see how. Let's start with the problem statement. Analyze the user table and tweet table and find out how many tweets are created by a person. And here you can see we have a user table. We have Alice, Tim, and John with their ID numbers, one, two, three. And we have a tweet table. In the tweet table, you have your um, the ID of the user and then what they tweeted. Uh, Google was a good, whatever it was, tennis, dot, 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 spacecraft, Olympics, politics, whatever they're tweeting about. The following operations were performed for analyzing given data. First, the Twitter data is loaded into the pig storage using load command. And you can see here we have our data coming in, and then that's going into pig storage. And this data is probably on an enterprise computer. So this is actually active Twitter's going on, and then it goes into Hadoop file system. Remember, the Hadoop file system is a data warehouse for storing data. And so the first step is we want to go ahead and load it into the pig storage, into our data storage system. The remaining operations performed are shown below. In join and group operation, the tweet and user tables are joined and grouped using cogroup command. And you can see here where we add a whole column when we go from uh, user names and tweet to the ID linked directly to the name. So Alice was uh, user 1, Tim was 2, and John 3. And so now they're listed with their actual tweet. The next operation is the aggregation. The tweets are counted according to the names. The command used is count. So it's very straightforward. We just want to count how many tweets each user is doing. And finally, the result after the count operation is joined with the user table to find out the username. And you can see here where Alice had 3, Tim 2, and John 1. Pig reduces the complexity of the operations, which would have been lengthy using MapReduce. In join and group operation, the tweet and user tables are joined and grouped using code group command. The next operation is the aggregation. The tweets are counted according to the names. The command used is count. The result after the count operation is joined with the user table to find out the username. And you can see we're talking about three lines of script versus a map reduce code of about 80 lines. Finally, we could find out the number of tweets created by a user in a simple way. So let's go quickly over some of the features of Pig that we already went through most of these. Uh, first, ease of programming as Pig Latin is similar to SQL. Less lines of code need to be written. Short development time as the code is simpler, so we can get our queries out rather quickly instead of having to have a programmer spend hours on it. Handles all kind of data like structured, semi-structured, and unstructured. Pig lets us create user-defined functions. Pig offers a large set of operators such as join, filter, and so on. It allows for multiple queries to process on parallel, and optimization and compilation is easy as it is done automatically and internally. So enough theory, let's dive in and show you a quick demo on some of the commands you can do in PIG. Today's setup will continue as we have in the last three demos to go ahead and use Cloudera Quick Start. And we'll be doing this in VirtualBox. We do have a tutorial in setting that up. You can send a note to our Simply Learn team and then get that link to you. Once your Cloudera Quick Start has uh, spun up, and remember this is VirtualBox. We've created a virtual machine and this virtual machine is CentOS Linux. Once it's spun up, you'll be in a full Linux system here. And as you can see, we have a Thunderbird browser, which opens up to the Hadoop Basic System browser. And we can go underneath the hue, where it comes up by default. If you click on the pull-down uh, menu and go under Editor, you can see there's our Impala, our Hive, uh, Pig, along with a bunch of other query languages you can use. And we're going under Pig. And then once you're in Pig, we can go ahead and use our command line here and just click that little blue button to start it up and running. We will actually be working in Terminal Window. And so if you are in the Cloudera Quick Start, you can open up the Terminal Window up top. Or if you're in your own setup and you're logged in, you can easily use all of your commands here in Terminal Window. And we'll zoom in. That way you get a nice view of what's going on. There we go. Now, for our first command, we're going to go ahead and do a Hadoop command and import some data into the Hadoop system, in this case a pig input. 
And let's just take a look at this. We have uh, Hadoop. Now let's know it's going to be a Hadoop command. DFS. There's actually four variations of DFS. So if you have HDFS or you know whatever, that's fine. All four of them point used to be different setups underneath different things, and now they all do the same thing. And we want to put this file, which in this case is under Home Cloudera Documents and Sample, and we just want to take that and put it into the pig input. And let's take a look at that file. If I go under my document browsers and open this up, you'll see it's got a simple ID, name, profession, and age. We have one Jack Engineer 25. And that was in uh, one of our earlier things we had in there. And so let's go ahead and uh, hit enter and execute this. And now we've uploaded that data and it's gone into our pig input. And then a lot of the uh, Hadoop commands mimic the Linux commands. And so you'll see we have cat as one of our commands or it has a hyphen before it. So we execute that with Hadoop DFS hyphen cat slash pig input because that's what we called it. That's where we put our uh, sample CSV at. And we execute this. You can see from our Hadoop system it's going to go in and pull that up and sure enough it pulls out the data file we just put in there. And then we can simply enter the pig Latin or pig editor mode by typing in pig. And we can see here uh, by our grunt, I told you that's how it was going to tell you you were in pig Latin. There's our grunt command line. So we are now in the pig shell. And then we'll go ahead and put our load command in here. And the way this works is I'm going to have office equals load. And here's my load. In this case, it's going to be pig input. We have that in single brackets. You remember that's where the data is in the Hadoop file system where we dumped it into there. We're going to be using pig storage. Our data was separated as with a comma. So there's our comma separator. And then we have as. And in this case, we have an ID, character array, name, character array, profession, character array, and age, character array. And we're just going to do them all as character arrays just to keep this simple for this one. And then when I hit um, put this all in here, you can see that's our full command line going in. And we have our semicolon at the end. So when I hit enter, it's now set office up. But it hasn't actually done anything yet. It doesn't do anything until we do dump office. So there's our command to execute whatever we've loaded or whatever setup we have in here. And we run that. You can see it go through the different languages. And this is going through the map reduce. Remember, we're not doing this locally. We're doing this on the Hadoop setup. And once we finished our dump, you can see we have ID, name, profession, age, and all the information that we just dumped into our pig. Oh, we can now do, let's say, um, oh, let's say we have a request just for, we'll keep it simple in here, but just for the name and age. And so we can go office, we'll call it each as our variable, underscore each, and we'll say for each office, generate name, comma, age. And for each means that we're going to do this for each row. And if you're thinking map reduce, you know that this is a map function because uh, it's mapping each row and generating name and age on here. And of course, we want to go ahead and close it with a semicolon. And then once we've created our uh, query or the um, command line in here, let's go ahead and dump office underscore each in with our semicolon. And this will go through our map reduce uh, setup on here. And if we were on a large cluster the same processing time would happen. In fact it's really slow because I have multiple things on this computer and this particular virtual box is only using a quarter of my processor. It's only dedicated to this. And you can see here there it is name and age. And it also included the top row since we didn't delete that out of there or tell it not to. And that's fine for this example. But you need to be aware of those things when you're processing a significantly large amount of data or any data. And we can also do um, office and we'll call this DSC for descending. So maybe the boss comes to you and says, hey, can we order office by ID descending? And of course, your boss, you've taught him how to, uh, your shareholder, it sounds a little derogatory when I say boss. You've talked to the shareholder and you said, uh, and you've taught them a little bit of pig Latin and they know that they can now create office description. And we can order office by ID description. And of course, once we do that, we have to dump office underscore description so that it'll actually execute. And there it goes into our map reduce. It'll take just a moment for it to come up because again, I'm running on only a quarter of my processor. And you can see we now have our IDs in descending order returned.
Let's also look at, uh, and this is so important with any time you're dealing with big data, let's create office with a limit. And you could, of course, do any of this instead of with office. We could do this with office descending, so you get just the top two IDs on there. Well, we're going to limit just to two. And, of course, to execute that, we have to dump office underscore limit. And you can just think of dumping uh, your garbage into the pig pen for the pig to eat. Uh, there we go. Dump office limit two. And that's going to just limit our office to the top. Two. And for our output, we get our um, first row, which had our ID, name, profession, and age, and our second row, which is Jack, who's an engineer. Now let's do a uh, filter. We'll call it office underscore uh, filter. You guessed it. Equals filter office by profession equals. And keep note, this is uh, similar to how Python does it with the double equal signs for equal for doing a true false statement. So for your logic statement, remember to use two equal signs in pig. And we're going to say it equals doctor. So we want to find out how many doctors do we have on our list. And we'll go ahead and do our dump. We're dumping all our garbage into the pig pen, and we're letting pig take over and see what it can find out and see who's a doctor on our list. And we find uh, employee ID number two, Bob, is a doctor, 30 years old. For this next section, uh, we're going to cover something we see a, a lot nowadays in data analysis, and that's word counting, tokenization. That is one of the next big steps as we move forward in our data analysis where we go from, say, stock market analysis of highs and lows and all the numbers to what are people saying about companies on Twitter? What are they saying on the web pages and on Facebook? Suddenly you need to start counting words and finding out how many words are totaled, how many are in the first part of the document, and so on. We're going to cover a very basic word count uh, example. And in this case, I've created a document called wordrows.text. And you can see here we have Simply Learn is a company supporting online learning. Simply Learn helps people attain their certifications. Simply Learn is an online community. I love Simply Learn. I love programming. I love data analysis. And I went and saved this into my documents folder so we could use it. And let me go ahead and open up a new uh, terminal window for our word count. Let me go ahead and close the old one. So we're going to go in here, and instead of doing this as pick, Pig, we're going to do pig minus x local. And what I'm doing is I'm telling the pig to start the pig shell, but we're going to be looking at files local to our virtual box or this CentOS machine. And let me go ahead and hit enter on there. Just maximize this up. There we go. And it'll load pig up, and it's going to look just the same as the pig we were doing, which was defaulted to, high, to our Hadoop system, to our HDFS. This is now defaulted to the local system. And now we're going to create lines. We're going to load it straight from the file. Remember last time we took the HDFS and loaded it into there and then loaded it into pig. Since we've gone the local, we're just going to run a local script. We have lines equals load home, the actual full path, home, Cloudera, documents, and I called it wordrows.txt. And as line is a character array, so each line, and I've actually, you can change this to read each document. I certainly have done a lot of document analysis, and then you go through and do word counts and different kind of counts in there. So once we go ahead and create our line, instead of doing the dump, we're going to go ahead and start entering all of our different setups for each of our steps we want to go through. And let's just take a look at this next one, because the load is straightforward. We're loading from this particular file. Since we're local, it's loading it directly from here instead of going into the Hadoop file system. And it says as, and then the, each line is read as a character uh, array. Now we're going to do words equal for each of the lines, generate flat tokenize, line space as word. Now there's a lot of ways to do this. This is if you're a programmer, you're just splitting the line up by spaces. There's actual ways to tokenize it. You gotta look for periods, capitalization. There's all kinds of other things you play with with this. But for the most basic word count, we're just going to separate it by spaces. The uh, flatten takes the line and just creates a, uh, it, it flattens each of the words out. So this is, uh, we're just going to generate a bunch of words for each line. And then each, each of those words is as a word. A little confusing in there, but it, if you really think about it, we're just going down each line, separating it out, and we're generating a list of words. One thing to note is the default for tokenize. You can just do tokenize line without the space in there. If you do that, it'll automatically tokenize it by space. You can do either one. And then we're going to do group. We're going to group it by words. So we're going to group words by word. So when we, we split it up, each token is a word, and it's a list of words. And so we're going to group equals group words by word. So we're going to group all the same words together. And if we're going to group them, then we want to go ahead and count them. And so for count, 
we'll go ahead and create a word count variable. And here's our for each. So for each grouped, grouped is our line where we group all the words in the line that are similar. We're going to generate a group. And then we're going to count the words. For each grouped, so for each line where we group the words together, we're going to generate a group, and that's going to count the words. So we want to know the word count in each of those. And that comes back in our word count. And finally, we want to take this, and we want to go ahead and dump word count. And this is a little bit more uh, what you see when you start looking at grunt scripts. You'll see right here, these, these lines right here, we have each of the steps you take to get there. So we load our file. For each of our um, lines, we're going to generate and tokenize it into words. Then we're going to take the words, and we're going to group them by same words. Uh, for each grouped, we're going to generate a group and we're just going to count the words. So we're going to summarize all the words in here. And let's go ahead and do our dump word count which executes all this and it goes through our map reduce. It's actually a local runner. You'll see down here you start seeing where they still have map reduce but as a special runner. We're mapping it. That's a part of each row being counted and grouped. And then when we do the word count, that's a reducer. The reducer creates these keys. And you can see I is used three times, A came up once, and came up once is to continue on down here to attain online people company analysis simply learn they took the uh, top rating with four uh, certification. So all these things are then counted in the uh, how many words are used. Uh, and in data analysis, this is probably the very the beginnings of data analysis where you might look at it and say, oh, they mentioned love uh, three times. So whatever's going on in this post, it's about love. And uh, what do they love? And then you might attach that to the different objects in here. So you can see that uh, Pig Latin is fairly easy to use. There's nothing really, you know, it, it, may, it takes a little bit to learn the script. Uh, depending on how good your memory is. As I get older, my memory leaks a little bit more, so I don't memorize it as much. But that was pretty straightforward, the script we put in there. And then it goes through the full map, reduce, localized run, comes out, and like I said, it's very easy to use. That's why people like Pig Latin, is because it's intuitive. One of the things I like about Pig Latin is when I'm troubleshooting. When we're troubleshooting, a lot of times you're working with a small amount of data, and uh, you start doing one line at a time, and so I can go, lines equal load and there's my loaded text and maybe I'll just dump lines and then it's going to run it's going to show me all the lines that I'm working on in this small amount of data and that way I can test that if I got an error on there that said oh this isn't working maybe I'll be like oh my gosh I'm in map reduce or I'm in the basic um, grunt shell instead of the local path grunt uh, so maybe it'll generate an error on there and you can see here, it just shows each of the lines going down. Hive versus pig. On one side, we'll have our sharp stinger on our black and yellow friend. And on the other side, our thick hide on our pig. Let's start with an introduction to HBase. Back in the days, data used to be less and was mostly structured. You can see we have structured data here. We usually had it like in a database where you had uh, every field was exactly the correct length. So if you had a name field, it was exactly 32 characters. I remember from the old access database in Microsoft. Microsoft. Uh, the files were small. If we had, you know, hundreds of people in one database, that was considered big data. This data could be easily stored in relational database or RDBMS. When we talk about relational database, uh, you might think of Oracle, you might think of SQL, Microsoft SQL, MySQL. All of these have evolved, even from back then, to do a lot more today than they did. But they still fall short in a lot of ways. And they're all examples of an RDMS, or relationship database. Then internet evolved, and huge volumes of structured and semi-structured data got generated. And you can see here with the semi-structured data, we have email. If you look at my spam folder, you know what we're talking about. All the HTML pages, XML, which is a lot of times displayed on our HTML and help desk pages, JSON. All of this really has just, even in the last, each year, it almost doubles from the year before how much of this is generated. So storing and processing this data on an RDBMS has become a major problem. And so the solution is we use Apache HBase. Apache HBase was the solution for this. Let's take a look at the history, the HBase history. And when we look at the HBase history, we're going to start back in uh, 2006, November. Google released a paper on Big Table. And then in 2017, just a few months later, HBase prototype was created as a Hadoop contribution. Later on in the year 2007, in October, first usable HBase along with the Hadoop 0.15 was released. And then in January of 2008, HBase became the sub 
project of Hadoop. And later on that year in October, all the way into September the next year, HBase was released the .81 version, the .19 version, and .20. And finally, in May of 2010, HBase became Apache top-level project. And so you can see in the course of about four years, HBase started off as just an idea on paper and has evolved all the way till 2010 as a solid project under the Apache. And since 2010, it's continued to evolve and grow as a major source for storing data in semi-structured data. So what is HBase? HBase is a column-oriented database management system derived from Google's NoSQL database, big table that runs on top of the Hadoop file system, or the HDFS. It's an open source project that is horizontally scalable, and that's very important to understand that you don't have to buy a bunch of huge expensive computers, you're expanding it by continually adding commodity machines. And so it's a linear cost expansion as opposed to being exponential. No SQL database written in Java, which permits faster querying. Uh, so Java is the back end for the HBase setup. And it's well suited for sparse data sets. So it can contain missing or NA values, and this doesn't boggle it down like it would another database. Companies using HBase. So let's take a look and see who is using this uh, no SQL database for their servers and for storing their data. And we have Hortonworks, which isn't a surprise because they're one of the, uh, like Cloudera Hortonworks, they are behind Hadoop and one of the big developments and backing of it. And of course, Apache HBase is the um, open source behind it. And we have Capital One as banks. You also see Bank of America, where they're collecting information on people and tracking it. Uh, so their information might be very sparse. They might have one bank way back when they collected information as far as the person's the family and what their income for the whole family is and their personal income and maybe another one doesn't collect the family income. As you start seeing where you have data that is uh, very difficult to store where it's missing a bunch of data. HubSpot's using it, Facebook, uh, certainly all of your Facebook, Twitter, most of your social medias are using it. And then of course there's JP Morgan, Chase and Company, another bank that uses the HBase as their data warehouse for NoSQL. Let's take a look at an HBase use case. So we can dig a little bit more into it to see how it functions. Telecommunication company that provides mobile voice and multimedia services across China, the China Mobile. And China Mobile, they generate billions of call detailed records, or CDR. And so these CDRs and all these records of these calls and how long they are and different aspects of the call, maybe the tower they're broadcasted from, all of that is being recorded so they can track it. A traditional database systems were unable to scale up to the vast volumes of data and provide a cost-effective solution. No good. So storing in real-time analysis of billions of call records was a major problem for this company. Solution? Apache HBase. HBase stores billions of rows of detailed call records. HBase performs fast processing of records using SQL queries. So you can mix your SQL and no SQL queries. And usually you just say no SQL queries because of the way the query works. Applications of HBase. One of them would be in the medical industry. HBase is used for storing genome sequences, storing disease history of people of an area, and you can imagine how sparse that is as far as both of those. A genome sequence might be only have pieces to it that each person is unique or is unique to different people. And the same thing with disease. You really don't need a column for every possible disease a person could get. You just want to know what those diseases those people have had to deal with in that area. E-commerce. HBase is used for storing logs about customer search history, performs analytics and targeting Target advertisement for better business insights. Sports. HBase stores match details in the history of each match. Uses this data for better prediction. So when we look at HBase, we all want to know what's the difference between HBase versus RDBMS. That is a relational database management system. HBase versus RDBMS. So the HBase does not have a fixed schema. It's schema-less. Defines only column families. And we'll show you what that means later on. An RDBMS has a fixed schema, which describes the structure are the tables. And you can think of this as you have a row and you have columns. And each column is a very specific structure, how much data can go in there and what it does. With the HBase, it works well with structured and semi-structured data. With the RDBMS, it works only well with structured data. With the HBase, it can have denormalized data. 
can contain missing or null values. With the RDBMS, it can store only normalized data. Now you can still store a null value in the RDBMS, but it still takes up the same space as if you're storing a regular value in many cases. And it also, for the HBase, is built for wide tables. It can be scaled horizontally. For instance, if you were doing a tokenizer of words and word clusters, you might have 1.4 million different words that you're pulling up and combinations of words. So with an RDBMS, it's built for thin tables that are hard to scale. You don't want to store 1.4 million columns in your SQL. It's going to crash and it's going to be very hard to do searches. With the age base, it only stores that data which is part of whatever row you're working on. Let's look at some of the features of the age base. It's scalable. Data can be scaled across various nodes as it is stored in the HDFS. And I always think about this, it's a linear add-on. For each terabyte of data, I'm adding on roughly $1,000 in commodity computing. With an enterprise machine, uh, we're looking at about 10000 at the lower end for each terabyte of data. And that includes all your backup and redundancy. So it's a big difference. It's like a tenth of the cost to store it across the HBase. It has automatic failure support. Write ahead log across clusters, which provides automatic support against failure. Consistent read and write. HBase provides consistent read and write of the data. It's a Java API for client access. Provides easy to use Java API for clients. Block cache and bloom filters. So the HBase supports block caching and bloom filters for high volume query optimization. Let's dig a little deeper into the HBase storage. HBase column oriented storage. And I told you we're going to look into this to see how it stores the data. And here you can see you have a row key. And this is really one of the important references is each row has to have its own key or your row ID. And then you have your column family. And in here you can see we have column family 1, column family 2, column family 3. And you have your column qualifiers. So you can have in column family 1, you can have three columns in there. And there might not be any data in that. So when you go into column family 1 and do a query for every column that contains a certain thing, that row might not have anything in there and not be queried. Where in column family 2, maybe you have column 1 filled out and column 3 filled out, and so on and so forth. And then each cell is connected to the row where the data is actually stored. Let's take a look at this and what it looks like when you fill the data in. So in here, we have a row key with a row ID, and we have our employee ID, 1, 2, 3. That's pretty straightforward. You probably would even have that on an SQL server. And then you have your column family. This is where it starts really separating out. Your column family, you might have personal data. And under personal data, you would have name, city, age. You might have a lot more than just that. You might have number of children. You might have degree, all those kinds of different things that go under personal data. And so some of them might be missing. You might only have the name and the age of an employee. You might only have the name, the city, and how many children and not the age. And so you can see with the personal data, you can now collect a large variety of data and store it in the age base very easily. And then maybe you have a family of professional data, your designation, your salary, all the stuff that the employee is doing for you in that company. Let's dig a little deeper into the age base architecture. And so you can see here what looks to be a complicated chart. It's not as complicated as you think. From the Apache age base, we have the zookeeper, which is used for monitoring what's going on. And you have your age master. This is the HBase master assigns regions and load balancing. And then underneath the region or the HBase master, then under the H master or HBase master, you have your reader server serves data for read and write. And the region server, which is all your different computers you have in your Hadoop cluster, you'll have a region, an H log, You'll have a store, memory store, and then you have your different files for H file that are stored on there. And those are separated across the different computers. And that's all part of the HDFS storage system. So when we look at the architectural components or regions, and we're looking down, we're drilling down a little bit, HBase tables are divided horizontally by a row. So you have a key range into regions. So each of those IDs, you might have IDs 1 to 20. 21 to 50, or whatever they are. Regions are assigned to the nodes in the cluster called region servers. A region contains all rows in the table between the region start key and the end key. Again, 1 to 10, 11 to 20, and so forth. These servers serve data for read and write. And you can see here we have the client and the get, and the get sends it out, and it finds out where that start, if it's between which start keys and end keys, and then it pulls the data from that different region server. And so the region signed data definition 
language operation. Create, delete are handled by the H master. So the H master is telling it, what are we doing with this data? What's going out there? Assigning and reassigning regions for recovery or load balancing and monitoring all servers. So that's also part of it. So, you know, if your IDs, if you have 500 IDs across three servers, you're not going to put 400 IDs on server one and 100 on server two and leave region three and region four empty. You're going to split that up. And that's all handled by the H master. And you can see here it monitors region servers, assigns regions to region servers, assigns regions to region servers, and so forth and so forth. HBase has a a distributed environment where HMaster alone is not sufficient to manage everything. Hence, Zookeeper was introduced. It works with HMaster. So you have an, an active HMaster which sends a heartbeat signal to Zookeeper indicating that it's active. And the Zookeeper also has a heartbeat to the region servers. So the region servers send their status to Zookeeper indicating they are ready for read and write operation. Inactive server acts as a backup. If the active HMaster fails, it will come to the rescue. Active HMaster and region servers connect with a session to Zookeeper. So you see your active HMaster selection, your region server session. They're all looking at the Zookeeper keeping that pulse. An active HMaster and region server connects with a session to the Zookeeper. And you can see here where we have ephemeral nodes for active sessions via heartbeats to indicate that the region servers are up and running. So let's take a look at uh, HBase read or write going on. There's a special HBase catalog table called the meta table which holds the location of the regions in the cluster. Here's what happens the first time a client reads or writes data to HBase. The client gets the region server, the host, the meta table from Zookeeper. And you can see right here the client has a request for your region server and goes, hey, Zookeeper, can you handle this? And the Zookeeper takes a look at it and goes, ah, meta location is stored in Zookeeper. So it looks at its meta data uh, on there. And then the metadata table location is sent back to the client. The client will query the meta server to get the region Region server corresponding to the row key if it wants to access. The client caches this information along with the meta table location. And you can see here the client going back and forth to the region server with the information. And it might be going across multiple region servers depending on what you're querying. So we get the region server for row key from the meta table. That's where that row key comes in and says, hey, this is where we're going with this. And so once it gets the row key from the corresponding region server, we can now put row or get row from that region server. Let's take a look at the HBase meta table. Special HBase catalog table that maintains a list of all the region servers in the HBase storage system. So you see here we have the meta table. We have a row key and a value, table key, region, region server. So the meta table is used to find the region for the given table key. And you can see down here, you know, our meta table comes in, it's going to fire out where it's going with the region server. And when we look a little closer at the write mechanism in HBase, we have write ahead log, or wall, as you abbreviate it, kind of a way to remember wall is write ahead log. It's a file used to store new new data that is yet to be put on permanent storage. It is used for recovery in the case of failure. So you can see here where the client comes in and it literally puts uh, the new data coming in into this kind of temporary storage or the wall on there. Once it's gone into the wall, then the memory store, memstore, is a write cache that stores the new data that has not yet been written to disk. There is one memstore per column family per region. And once we've done that, we have three, ACK. Once the data is placed in memstore, the client then receives the acknowledgement. When the memstore reaches the threshold, it dumps or commits the data into H file. And so you can see right here, we've uh, taken our, our, it's gone into the wall, the wall then sorts it into the different memory stores, uh, and then the memory stores it says, hey, we've reached, uh, we're ready to dump that into our H files, and then it moves it into the H files. H files store the rows of data as stored key value on disk. So here we've done a lot of theory. Let's dive in and just take a look and see what some of these commands look like and what happens in our H base when we're manipulating a NoSQL setup. So if you're learning a new setup, it's always good to start with, where is this coming from? It's open source by Apache. And you can go to hbase.apache.org. And you'll see that it has a lot of information. You can actually download the HBase separate from the Hadoop, although most people just install the Hadoop because it's bundled with it. And if you go in here, you'll find a reference guide. And so you can go through the Apache uh, reference guide. And there's a number of things to look at, but we're going to be going through Apache HBase shell. That's what we're going to be working with. And there's a lot of other interfaces 
on the setup and you can look up a lot of the different commands on here so when we go into the Apache HBase reference guide and we can go down to read HBase shell commands from a command file you can see here where it gives you different options of formats for putting the data in and listing the data certainly you can also create files and scripts to do this too but we're going to look at the basics and we're going to go through this on a basic um, HBase shell and one last thing to look at is of course if you continue down the um, setup you can see here where they have more detail as far as how to create and how to get to your data on your HBase. Now I will be working in a virtual box and this is by Oracle. You can download the Oracle virtual box. You can put a note in below for the YouTube as we did have a previous session on setting up virtual setup to run your Hadoop system in there. I'm using the Cloudera Quick Start installed in here. There's Hordens. You can also use the Amazon Web Service. There's a number of options for trying this out. In this case we have Cloudera on the Oracle virtual box. The virtual box has Linux CentOS installed on it and then the Hadoop it has all the different Hadoop flavors including HBase. And I bring this up because my computer is a Windows 10. The operating system of the virtual box is Linux and we're looking at the HBase data warehouse. And so we have three very different entities all running on my computer. And that can be confusing if it's the first time in and working with this kind of setup. Now you'll notice in our uh, Cloudera setup they actually have some HBase monitoring. So I can go underneath here and click on HBase and master and it'll tell me what's going on with my region servers. It'll tell me what's going on with our backup tables. Right now I don't have any user tables because we haven't created any. And this is only a single node and a single HBase tour. So you're not going to expect anything too extensive in here since this is for practice and education and perhaps testing out package you're working on. It's not for really, you can deploy Cloudera of course, but when you talk about a quick start or a single node setup, that's what it's really for. So we can go through all the different HBase and you'll see all kinds of different information with Zookeeper if you saw it flash by down here, what version we're working in since Zookeeper is part of the HBase setup. Where we want to go is we want to open up a terminal window and in Cloudera it happens to be up at the top and when you click on here you'll see your Cloudera terminal window open. And let me just expand this so we have a nice full screen and then I'm also going to zoom in. That way you have a nice big picture and you can see what I'm typing and what's going out on. And to open up your HBase shell simply type HBase shell to get in and hit enter and you'll see it takes just a moment to load and we'll be in our HBase shell for doing HBase commands. Once we've gotten into our HBase shell you'll see you'll have the HBase prompt information ahead of it. We can do something simple like list. And this is going to list whatever tables we have. And it so happens that there's a base table that comes with HBase. Now we can go ahead and create and I'm going to type in just create. What's nice about this is it's going to throw me kind of a, uh, it's going to say hey there's no just straight create. But it does come up and tell me all these different formats we can use for create. So we can create our table and one of our uh, families. We can add splits, names, versions, all kinds of things you can do with this. But let's just start with a very basic one on here. And let's go ahead and create and we'll call it new table. Uh, let's just call it new TBL for table. New table. And then we also want to do, let's do knowledge. So let's take a look at this. I'm creating a new table and it's going to have a family of knowledge in it. And let me hit enter. And it's going to come up. It's going to take it a second to go ahead and create it. Now we have our new table in here. And so if I go list, you'll now see table and new table. So you can now see that we have the new table and of course the default table that's set up in here. And we can do something like uh, describe. We can describe and then we're going to do new TBL. And when we describe it, it's going to come up. It's going to say, hey, name, I have knowledge, data block encoding none, bloom filter, row, or replication scope, version, all the different information you need. New, yeah, minimum version, zero, forever, deleted cells, false, block size, in memory. And you can look this stuff up on apache.org to really track it down. One of the things that's important to note is versions. So you have your different versions of the data that's stored. And that's always important to understand that. We might talk about that a little bit later on. And then after we describe it, we can also do a uh, status. The status says I have one active master going on. That's our HBase as a whole. We can do status 
summary. That should do the same thing as status. So we got the same thing coming up. And now that we've created it, let's go ahead and put something in it. So we're going to put new TBL, and then we want row one. You know what? Before I even do this, let's just type in put. And you can see when I type in put, it gives us like a lot of different options of how it works and different ways of formatting our data as it goes in. And all of them usually begin with the new table, new TBL. Then we have, in this case, we'll call it row one, and then we'll have knowledge. If you remember, we created knowledge already, and we'll do knowledge sports, and then in knowledge and sports, we're going to set that equal to cricket. So we're going to put underneath this uh, our knowledge setup that we have a, a thing called sports in there. And we'll see what this looks like in just a second. And let's go ahead and put in, we'll do a couple of these. Let's see, let's do another row one, and this time, instead of sports, let's do science. You know, this person not only, you know, we have row one, which is both knowledgeable in cricket and also in chemistry. So it's a chemist who plays cricket in row one. And um, let's see, if we have, let's do another row row one just to keep it going and we'll do science in this case let's do physics not only in chemistry but also a physicist I have a, a, quite a joy in physics myself so here we go we have uh, row one there we go and then let's do uh, row two let's see what that looks like when we start putting in row two and in row two this person is has knowledge in economics this is a master of business and how or maybe it's global economics maybe it's just for the business and how it fits in with the country country's economics. And we'll call it macroeconomics. So I guess it is for the whole country there. So we have knowledge, economics, macroeconomics. And then let's just do one more. We'll keep it as row two. And this time our economist is also a musician. So we'll put music. And they happen to have knowledge and they enjoy, oh, let's do pop music. They're into the current pop music going on. So we've loaded our database. And you'll see we have two rows, row one and row two in here. And we can do is we can list the contents of our database database by simply doing scan. Uh, scan and then let's just do scan by itself so you can see how that looks. You can always just type in there and it tells you all the different setups you can do with scan and how it works. In this case we want to do scan new TBL and in our scan new TBL we have row 1, row 1, row 2, row 2. And you'll see row 1 has a column called knowledge, science, time step, value crickets, value physics. So it has information as when it was created, when the timestamp is, Row 1 also has knowledge sports and a value of cricket. So we have sports and science. And this is interesting because if you remember up here, we also gave it originally, we told it to come in here and have chemistry. We had science, chemistry, and science, physics. And we come down here, I don't see the chemistry. Why? Because we've now replaced chemistry with physics. And so the new value is physics on here. Let me go ahead and clear down a little bit. And in this, we're going to ask the question, is enabled new table. When I hit enter in here, you're going to see it comes out true. And then we'll go ahead and disable it. Let's go ahead and disable new table. Make sure I have our quotes around it. And now that we've disabled it, what happens when we do the scan? When we do the scan new table, I hit enter, you're going to see that we get an error coming up. So once it's disabled, you can't do anything with it until we re-enable it. Now, before we enable the table, let's do an alteration on it. And here's our new table. And this should look a little familiar because it's very similar to create. We'll call this test info. And we'll hit enter in there. It'll take just a moment for updating. And then we want to go ahead and enable it. So let's go ahead and enable our new table. So it's back up and running. And then we want to describe. Describe new table. And we come in here, you'll now see we have name knowledge. And under there we have our data encoding and all the information under knowledge. And then we also have down below test info. So now we have the name test info and all the information can concerning the test info on here. And we'll simply enable it, new table. So now it's enabled. Oops, I already did that. I guess we'll enable it twice. And so let's start looking at, well, we had scan new table. And you can see here where it brings up the information like this. But what if we want to go ahead and get a row? So we'll do R1. And when we do HBase R1, you can see we have knowledge science, and it has a timestamp value physics. And we have knowledge sports, and it has a timestamp on it and value cricket. And then let's see what happens when we put into our 
new table. And in here we want row one. And if you can guess from earlier, because we did something similar, uh, we're going to do knowledge economics. And then it's going to be instead of, uh, I think it was what, uh, macroeconomics, it's now market economics. And we'll go back and do our git command and now see what it looks like. And we can see here where we have knowledge economics. It has a timestamp value, market economics, physics, and cricket. And this is because we have uh, economics, science, and sports. Those are the three different columns that we have, and then each one has different information in it. And so if you manage to go through all these commands and look at basics on here, you'll now have the ability to create a very basic HBase setup, no SQL setup, based on your columns and your rows. And just for fun, we'll go back to the Cloudera, where they have the website up for the HBase master status, and I'll go ahead and refresh it. And then we can go down here, and you'll see user tables, table set one, and we can click on details, and here's what we just did. It goes through. Uh, so if you're the admin looking at this, you can go, oh, someone just created new TBL, and this is what they have underneath of it in their new table. In there. So if you are interested in mastering the world of data engineering, look no further than our postgraduate program in data engineering. This comprehensive course is tailor-made for professionals like you, diving deep into the essential topics such as Hadoop framework, Spark-based data processing, Kafka-driven data pipelines, and the intricacies of managing big data on AWS and Azure cloud infrastructures. A unique approach blends live session, hands-on industry projects, exciting IBM hackathons, and interactive Ask Me Anything sessions to provide you with the most enriching learning experience. Elevate your data engineering skills and career prospects today. For admission to this data engineering course, a bachelor's degree with an average of 50% or higher marks is required, a 2 plus years of work experience is preferred, and basic understanding of object-oriented programming is preferred. So enroll now. Today we're covering the Hadoop ecosystem, at least the very fundamentals of all the different parts that are in the Hadoop ecosystem. And it's very robust. It's grown over the years with different things added in. There's a lot of overlapping in a lot of these tools, but we're just going to cover these basic tools so you can see what's available in the Hadoop ecosystem. So let's go back to our Hadoop ecosystem. As you can see, we have all our different setup, and let's focus on the Hadoop part of it first before we look at the different tools. We start with the Hadoop, or HDFS, is for data storage. Write once, read many times, you can store a lot of data on it affordably. Distributed file system. And so we talk about the Hadoop file system, it stores different formats of data on various machines. And so you have like a huge cluster of computers and you're able to store Word documents, spreadsheets, structured data, non-structured data, semi-structured. And in the Hadoop file system, there's the two different sets of servers in there. There's the name node, which is the master. We talked about that. That's your enterprise computer. And the other component is your data nodes. And so you'll usually have, like I said, one to two. You'll have a name node and maybe a backup name node. And then you'll have as many data nodes as you want. And you can just keep adding them. That's what makes it so affordable. You know, you have a rack of computers and you go, oh, I need more space. You just add another rack in. So it's very affordable and very ex easy to expand. And the way the Hadoop file system itself works behind the hood is it splits the data into multiple blocks. By default, it's 128 megabytes. And the 120 megabytes, it is a default setting. You can change that. That works for most data. There's reasons for either processing speed or for better distribution of the data. So if you have little tiny blocks of data that are less than 128 megabytes, if you have a lot of those, you might want to go down in size and vice versa for larger blocks. Uh, and you can see right here we have 300 megabytes and it takes that piece of data and it just divides it into blocks of data and each one's 128, 128, and 44, which if you add together equals 300 megabytes. And now that you understand the Hadoop file system, or at least the basic overview of it, it's important to note what it sits on, what's actually making all this work on the back end. And this is Yarn. Hadoop Yarn is a cluster resource management. So it's how it manages this whole cluster right here that we just looked at. And YARN stands for Yet Another Resource Negotiator. Love the title. It reminds me of an Iron Man movie with you know Tony Starks and Jarvis. Just a rather intelligent system or whatever it stood for. But YARN has become very widely used and it's actually used as a backend for a lot of other packages. So it's not just in Hadoop, but Hadoop is where it came from and where it's set up. And there's some other ones. Another popular one is uh, Mesos, which I'll mention again briefly. 
And so the yarn, it handles the cluster of nodes. It's the one that when you hear yarn, it's the one that's going, hey, where's our RAM at? Where's our hard drives at? Or if you have a solid state disk drive, your SD, where's that at? How much memory do I have? What can I put where? And so here we go. Nice image of it, RAM, memory, resources. So it's allocating all these different resources for different applications is what it's doing. When we talk about the back to the two major components, the two major components is your resource manager. That's on the master server or your uh, enterprise computer and then that one is in control and managing what's going on with all of your nodes. Data processing in Hadoop, MapReduce. And we're going to talk about the MapReduce here in just a second. The Hadoop data processing is all built upon MapReduce. MapReduce processes a large volumes of data in parallel distributed manner. And this is very core to Hadoop. But before we go on, because there's other tools out there and things are slowly shifting and there's all kinds of new things, one of the things you want to look at is not just how the map reduce works, but start thinking map reduce. One of the best pieces of advice I had from a uh, one of my uh, mentors in data science was think map reduce. This is really what you should be learning. But it is an actual process in the Hadoop system. So we have our big data and the big data maps out. And so this is the first step is if I'm looking at my data, how do I map that data out? What am I looking at? And it could be something as simple as I just loaded into, um, you know, I'm just looking at one line at a time. But it could be that I'm looking at the data one line at a time, but I only need columns one and four. Maybe I'm looking at it one column at a time, but I need the total of column one added together and column one over column two. So you can start to see and get some very complicated mapping here, but the mapping is what do you do with each line of data, each piece of data. Uh, if you're in a spreadsheet, it's easy to see you have a row. Whatever you do to that row, that's what you're mapping because it doesn't look at anything else. It doesn't know anything else. All it knows is what's on that row. Uh, if you're looking at documents, maybe it's pulling one document at a time, and so your map is then a document. And then it takes those and we shuffle and sort them. How do we sort them around? Whether you're grouping them together, whether you're taking the whatever information you mapped out, of it. Word counts, you're counting the word A, so letter A comes out with how many for each mapping. If you have 54 A's per the one document, 53 in the other ones, that's what's coming out of that mapping and going into the shuffle and sort. And so if it's counting A's and B's and C's, it'll shuffle and sort all the A's together, all the B's together. If you're running a big data for running agriculture, apples and oranges. So it puts all the apples in one, all the stuff you mapped out that you said, hey, these are all apples, these are all oranges. Let's shuffle them and sort them together. And then we reduce and reduce. So each of these groups reduce into the data you want out. So you have map, shuffle, sort, reduce. And some important things to know about the Hadoop file system, because I'm going to mention Spark in a little bit, is the Hadoop file system manages to do a lot of this by writing it to the hard drive. So if you're running a really low budget, which nobody does anymore with the Hadoop file system, and you have all your commodity machines are all low, they only have a 8 gigabytes memory instead of 128 gigabytes. This process uses the hard drive, and so it, it pulls it into the RAM for your mapping, it maps a one piece of data, then it writes that map to the hard drive. Then it takes that mapping from the hard drive, loads it up, and shuffles it and writes it back to the hard drive to a different spot. And then takes that information and starts processing it in the reduce, and then it writes the reduce answer to the hard drive. It runs slower because you're accessing to and from your hard drive or solid state drive if you have an SD card in there. But you can also utilize, it's a lot more affordable. You know, it's like I said, you having that higher end of RAM cost even on a commodity machine. So you can save a lot of money. Nowadays, it's so affordable, people run the uh, Spark setup on there, which does the same thing but in RAM. And again, we'll talk about Spark in just a little bit. And of course, the final thing is an output. So again, your reduce are written to the hard drive, and then your reduce is brought together to form one output. What is the maximum number of oranges sold per an area? I don't know. I'm making that up. One of the things about Hadoop is it covers so many different things that anything you can think of, you can put in Hadoop. The question is, do you need need to? Do you have enough data or enough need for the high-end processing? So again, look at map or reduce, but think of this not just as map reduce. Start thinking map and reduce when you think big data. We're going to start getting into the tools because you had all those pictures of all those cool tools we have. So we're going to look at the first two of those tools. And uh, in the tools we have scoop and flume. And this is for your data collection and ingestion. We're going to bring Spark up in just a second. 
can also play a major role in this. Because Spark is its own animal that sprung from Hadoop, connects into Hadoop, but it can run completely independent. But Scoop and Flume are specific to Hadoop and they're ways to bring in information into the Hadoop file system. And so when we talk about these, we'll start with Scoop. Scoop is used to transfer data between Hadoop and external data stores, such as relational databases and enterprise data warehouses. And so you can see right here, here's our Hadoop data, and it's connecting up there, and it's either pushing the data or pulling the data, and we have our relational database and enterprise data warehouse. And there's that magic word enterprise. That means these are the servers that are very high-end. So maybe you have a high-end SQL server or a MySQL server or whatever over there, and this is what's coming and going from the scoop. It imports data from external data stores into the HDFS Hive and HBase. Those are our two specific. The Hive setup is your SQL, basically. And you can see a nice little image here. Here's somebody on their laptop, which would be considered the um, client machine, putting together their code. They push the scoop. The scoop goes into the task manager. The task manager then goes, hey, what have I got for the HBase and Hive system in our Hadoop system? And then it reaches out to the enterprise data warehouse or into the document-based system or relationship base database. Relationship is your non-SQL. Document is just what it sounds like is you have HTML documents or Word documents or text documents and it's able to map those tasks and then bring those into the Hadoop file system. Now Flume is a distributed service for collecting, aggregating, and moving large amounts of log data. So kind of focused a little bit on a slightly different set of data although you'll find these overlap a lot. You can certainly use Flume to do a lot of things that you can do in Scoop and vice versa. Flume ingests the data so we're looking at like say a JSON call to a website. XML documents, um, unstructured and semi-structured data is most commonly digested by Flume. Best example I saw was a Twitter account pulling Twitter feeds into a Hadoop system. So it ingests online streaming data from social media, Twitter, log files, so we want to know what's going on with error codes on your servers and all those log files, web server, what's going on in your web server. We can bring all this stuff in and just dump it into the Hadoop data file system to be looked at and processed later. And it's a web server, cloud, social media data, again, all those different sources it can be. It's kind of endless. It, you know, it, it just depends on what your company needs. Versatility utility of Hadoop is what makes it such a powerful source to add into a company. And so it comes in there, you have your source, it goes through the channels, it then goes through kind of a sync feature to make sure everything is in sync, and then it dumps it into the Hadoop file system. So we've covered in the Hadoop file system the first two things. Let's look at some of the scripting languages they have. And so we have the two here, and you can also think of these, um, it actually says scripting and SQL queries. A lot of times they're both referred to as queries. So you have both the uh, pig and the hive. And pig is used to analyze data in Hadoop. It provides a high level data processing language to perform numerous operations on the data. And it's made out of pig Latin, language for scripting. Pig Latin compiler converts pig Latin code to execute code. And then you have your ETL. The ETL provides a platform for building data flow for ETL. And ETL is like the catch three letters now on any job interview I look at. It says ETL. It just means extract, transfer, and load. So all we're doing is extracting the data, transferring it to where we need it, and then loading it into, in this case, a Hadoop file system. And there's other pieces to that. You know, it's actually a big thing because whenever you're extracting data, do you want to dump all the data or do you want to do some kind of pre-processing so you're only bringing in what you want? And then one of the cool things about Pig Latin is 10 lines of Pig Latin script is around 200 lines of map reduce job. Again, the map reduce is the back-end processes that go on. And so if we have Pig, and I, I'll be honest with you, Pig is very easy to use, but as a scripter programmer, I find it's more for people who just need a quick pull of the data and able to do some very basic things very easily. So if you're doing some very high-end processing and model building, you usually end up in something else. So Pig's great for that. Like if you're in the management and you need to build a quick query report, Pig is really good for that. And so it definitely has its place. It's definitely a very useful uh, script to know. 
And the pig Latin scripts, they call it the grunt shell. I guess it goes with pig because they grunt. You have your pig server. You have a parser, an optimizer, a compiler, an execution engine. And that's all part of the Apache pig. And this then goes into the map reduce, which then goes into the Hadoop file system in the Hadoop. Um, and you'll see Apache with a lot of these because it's under the open source. Uh, Hadoop's under the Apache open source. So all this stuff is you'll see under Apache with the name tag on there. And if you're going to know pig, Hive is the other one that's really popular for easy query. Hive facilitates reading, writing, and managing large data sets residing in the distributed storage using SQL, Hive Query Language. And this is important because a lot of times you're coming from an SQL server. There's your enterprise set up, and now you're archiving a history of what's going on on that server. So you're continually pulling data using Scoop onto your, um, into your H base, a Hive database. And as it comes in there, it'd be nice to just use that same query to pull the data out of the Hadoop file system. And that's exactly what it does. So you have Hive command line. You can also use a JBC or ODBC driver. Um, and those drivers, like if you're working in Java or you're working in uh, Python, you can use those drivers to access Hive. So you don't have to go through the Hive command line. But it makes it real quick. I can take a Hive command line and just punch in a couple words and pull up my data. And so it provides user-defined functions, UDF, for data mining, document indexing, log processing, again, anything that is in some kind of SQL format. If it's stored that properly on the Hadoop file system, you can use your Hive to pull it out. And you see even a more robust image of what's in the Hive. There's your client machine. That's you on your laptop or you're logged in wherever you're at, writing your script. That goes into the driver. We have your compiler, your optimizer, executor. You also have your JDBC, ODBC connections, which goes into the Hive Thrift server, which then goes into the driver. Your Hive web interface, so you can just log in on the web and start typing away your SQL commands and that again goes to the driver and all those pieces and those pieces go to your job tracker your name node and your actual Hadoop file system so spark real-time data analysis spark is an open source distributed computing engine for processing and analyzing huge volumes of real-time data so it runs a hundred times faster than MapReduce. MapReduce is the basics of the Hadoop system which is usually set up in a Java code in spark the map reduce instead of running um, what happens in MapReduce is it goes pulls it into the RAM, writes it to the hard drive, reads it off the hard drive, shuffles it around, writes it back to the hard drive, pulls it off the hard drive, does its processing, and you get the impression it's going in and out of RAM to the hard drive and back up again. So if you don't have a lot of RAM and you have older computers and you don't have the RAM to process something, then Spark and Hadoop are going to run the same speed. Otherwise, Spark goes, hey, let's keep this all in the RAM and run faster. And that's what we're talking about is provides in-memory computation of data. So it's fast. You can see the guy running through the door there. Speedy versus a very slow Hadoop wandering around. And it's used to process and analyze real-time streaming data such as stock market and baking data. So the Spark can have its own stuff going on and then it can access the Hadoop database. It can pull data just like Scoop and Flume do. So it has all those features in it. And uh, you can even run Spark with its own yarn outside of Hadoop. There's also Spark on Mesos, which is another resource manager, although yarn is most commonly used. And currently Spark pretty much comes installed with Hadoop. And so your Spark running on top of Hadoop will use the same nodes. It has its own manager and it utilizes the RAM so you'll have both you can have uh, the spark on top of there and here we go you have your driver program your spark context it goes into your cluster manager your yarn then you have your worker nodes which are going to be executing tasks and cache and it's important to remember when you're running the spark setup even though these are commodity machines we're still usually a lot of them are like 128 gigabytes of ram so that Spark can run these high-end processes. Certainly, if it's not accessed very much and you're building a, um, a Hadoop cluster, you could drop that RAM way down if you're doing just queries without any kind of processing on there and you're not doing a lot of queries. But, you know, generally Spark, you're looking at higher end. Uh, there's still commodity machines to do your work. And now we get into the Hadoop machine learning. And so machine learning is its own animal. I keep saying that. These are all kind of unique things. Mahout 
is being phased out. I mean, people still use it. It's still important if you can write your basic machine learning that has most of the tools in there. You certainly can do it in Mahout. Mahout, again, writes to the hard drive, reads from the hard drive. You can do all that in Spark, and it's faster because it's just in RAM. And so Spark has its own machine learning tools in it. And you can also use PySpark, which then accesses all the different Python tools. And there's, there's just so many tools you can dump into Spark. Mahout is very limited, but it's also very basic, which in itself can be really good. Sometimes simple is better. So Mahout is used to create scalable and distributed machine learning algorithms. So here we have our Mahout environment. It builds a machine learning application. So you're doing linear regression, you're doing clustering, you're doing classification models. It has a library that contains inbuilt algorithms for all of these. And then it has collaborative filtering. And again, there's our classification and there's our clustering regression. So you have your different machine learning tools. We can easily classify a large amount of data using Mahout. So this brings us to the next set of tools we have, or the next tool, which is the Apache Ambari. Ambari is an open source tool responsible for keeping track of running applications and their statuses. Think of this as like a traffic cop, uh, more like a security guard. You can open it up and see what's going on. And so the Apache Ambari manages, monitors, and provisions Hadoop clusters, provides a central management service to start, stop, and configure Hadoop services. So again, it's like a traffic cop. Hey, stop over there start keep going hey what's going on over that area in uh, the through lane on the high-speed freeway and you can open this up and you have a really easy view of what's going on and so you can see right here you have the Ambari web the Ambari web is what you're looking at that's your interface that you've logged into the Ambari server this will be uh, usually on the master node it's usually if you're going to install Ambari you might as well just install it on the same node and it connects up to the database and then it has agents and each agent takes a look and see what's going on with its host server and if you're going to have uh, two more systems, and we talked about Spark streaming, there's also Kafka and Apache for streaming data coming in. And Kafka is distributed streaming platform to store and process streams of records. And it's written in Scala. Builds real-time streaming data pipelines that reliably get data between applications. Builds real-time streaming applications that transforms data into streams. So it kind of goes both ways on there. So Kafka uses a messaging system for transferring data from one application to another. So we have our sender, we have our message queue, and then we have our receiver. Pretty straightforward, very solid setup on there with the Kafka. Apache Storm. Storm is a processing engine that processes real-time streeting at a very high speed. And it's written in Clojure. They utilize the function-based programming style of Clojure, and it's based on Lisp, to give it the speed. That's why Apache Storm is built on there. So you could think of Kafka as a slow-moving, very solid communication network where Storm is looking at the real-time data and grabbing that streaming data that's coming in fast. So it has an ability to process over a million jobs in a fraction of seconds on a node. So it's massive. It can really reach out there and grab the data. And it's integrated with Hadoop to harness higher throughputs. So this is the two big things about Storm. If you are polling, I think they mentioned stock coming in or something like that, where you're looking for the latest data popping up, Storm is a really powerful tool to use for that. So we've looked at a couple more tools for bringing data in. We probably should talk a little bit about security. Security has, in Hadoop, has the Apache Ranger and Apache Knox are the two most popular ones. And the Ranger, the Apache Ranger, Ranger is a framework to enable, monitor, and manage data securities across the Hadoop platform. So the first thing it does is it provides centralized security administration to manage all security-related tasks. The second thing it does is it has a standardized authorization across all Hadoop components. And third, it uses enhanced support for different authorization methods, role-based access control, attribute-based access control, etc. So your Apache Ranger can go in there and your administrator coming in there can now very easily monitor who has what rights and what they can do and what they can access. So there's also Apache Knox. Knox is an application gateway for interacting with the REST APIs and the UIs of Hadoop developers. And so we have our 
application programmer interfaces, our user interfaces, and we talk about REST APIs. This means we're pulling, this is looking at the actual um, data coming in, what applications are going on. So if you have an, an application where people are pulling data off of the Hadoop system or pushing data into the Hadoop system, the NOx is going to be on that setup. And it delivers three groups of user-facing services. One, proxy services, provides access to Hadoop via proxying the HTTP request. Two, authentication services, authentication for REST API access and web SSO flow for user interfaces. So there's our REST. And finally, client services. Client development can be done with the scripting through DSL or using the Knox shell classes. So the first one is if you have a website coming in and out, your HTTP request. Again, your three different services are what's coming in and out of the Hadoop file system. So there's a couple of the security setups. Let's go ahead and take a look at workflow system, the Uzi. And there's some other ones out there. Uzi is the one that's specific to Hadoop. There's also like a Zookeeper out there and some other ones. Uzi is pretty good. Uzi is a workflow scheduler system to manage Hadoop jobs. And so you have a workflow engine and a coordinator engine. So it consists of two parts. What's going on and coordinating what's going on. And uh, directed ASLIC graph DAGs, which specifies a sequence of actions to be executed. These consist of workflow jobs triggered by time and data available. And if you're not familiar with directed ASLIC graphs or DAGs or whatever terminology you want to throw at this, this is basically a flow chart. You start with process A, then the next process would be process B when process A is done. And it might be that process C can only be done when process D, E, and F are done. So you want to be able to control this. You don't want it to um, process the machine learning script and then pull the data in that you want to process it on. You want to make sure it's going in the right order. So these consist of workflow jobs and they're triggered by time and data availability. So maybe you're pulling stocks in the middle of the night and once the stock is all pulled, so there's our time sequence. It says, hey, they've been posted on the other websites. They post them usually after the stock market closes, the highs and lows and everything. Then once that data has been brought in, you know, on a time specific, bringing the data in at a certain time, once the data is available, then we want to trigger our machine learning script for what's going to happen next. And so we can see here we have a start, our map reduce program, our action node, and it begins and either we have a success, then we notify the client of success, usually an email is sent out, in successful completion. Or we don't have a success, we have an error. Notify client of error, email action node, kill unsuccessful termination. And usually at this point they say email action notification, but I'm mostly that's usually a pager system. And so you see all the tech guys running to the server room or wherever, you know, we're, our pager just went off. We got to figure out what went down. You know, the other one is you just look at the next morning, you go, oh, well, let's make sure everything went through this morning and check all your successes. With the error, usually it's sent to your pager and your emergency uh, call to open up in the middle of the night and log in. So that concludes our basic set up with the Hadoop ecosystem. So a quick recap on the Hadoop ecosystem. We covered going looking at the middle part. We had the Hadoop as a file system and how it stores data across multiple servers. It saves money because it's about a tenth of the cost of using enterprise uh, computers. We looked at YARN, cluster resource management, and how that works to hold everything together. And then we looked at a lot of data processing. How does it process in and out of the Hadoop system, including the map and reduce setup, which is the Hadoop basic in Java. And and for that, we looked at data collection and ingestion with Scoop and Flume. We looked at queries using the scripting language PIG and the SQL queries through Hive. We glanced at Spark. Remember, Spark usually comes installed now with the Hadoop system because it does so much of its own processing. It covers a lot of the data in, real-time data analysis set up on there. We looked at Mahout machine learning. We looked at Apache Ambari for management and monitoring, kind of your security guard and traffic control. Uh, just like we have Scoop and Flume, which brings data in there. We looked at Kafka and Apache Storm, which is for streaming data. And then we looked at Apache Ranger and Apache Knox for security. And finally, we went in through the, we took a glance at Uzi for your workflow system. What is data science? Let's start with some of the common definitions that's doing the rounds. Some say that data science is a powerful new approach for making discoveries from data. Others term it as an automated way to analyze enormous amounts of data and extract information from it. Still others refer to it as a new discipline which combines aspects of statistics, mathematics, programming, and visualization to gain insights. Now that you have looked at some of its definitions, let's learn more about data science. 
When domain expertise and scientific methods are combined with technology, we get data science, which enables one to find solutions for existing problems. Let's look at each of the components of data science separately. The first component is domain expertise and scientific methods. Data scientists should also be domain experts, as they need to have a passion for data and discover the right patterns in them. Traditionally, domain experts, like scientists and statisticians, collected and analyzed the data in a laboratory setup or a controlled environment. The data was then subject to relevant laws or mathematical and statistical models to analyze the data set and derive relevant information from it. For instance, they used the models to calculate the mean, median, mode, standard deviation, and so on of a data set. It helped them test their hypothesis or create a new one. In the next slide, we will see how data science technology has now made this process faster and more efficient. But before we do that, let's understand the different types of data analysis, an important aspect of data science. Data analysis can either be descriptive, where one studies a data set to explain what happened, or be predictive, where one creates a model based on existing information to predict the outcome and behavior. It can also be prescriptive, where one suggests the action to be taken in a given situation using the collected information. We now have access to tools and techniques that process data and extract the information we need. For instance, there are data processing tools for data wrangling. We have new and flexible programming languages that are more efficient and easier to use. With the creation of operating systems that support multiple OS platforms, it's now easier to integrate systems and process big data. Application designs and extensive software libraries help develop more robust, scalable, and data-driven applications. Data scientists use these technologies to build data models and run them in an automated fashion to predict the outcome efficiently. This is called machine learning, which helps provide insights into the underlying data. They can also use data science technology to manipulate data, extract information from it, and use it to build tools, applications, and services. But technological skills and domain expertise alone, without the right mathematical and statistical knowledge, might lead data scientists to find incorrect patterns and convey the wrong information. Now that you have learned what data science is, it will be easier to understand what a data scientist does. Data scientists start with a question or a business problem. Then they use data acquisition to collect data sets from the real world. The process of data wrangling is implemented with data tools and modern technologies that include data cleansing, data manipulation, data discovery, and data pattern identification. The next step is to create and train models for machine learning. They then design mathematical or statistical models. After designing a data model, it's represented using data visualization techniques the next task is to prepare a data report. After the report is prepared, they finally create data products and services. Let us now look at the various skills a data scientist should have. Data scientists should ask the right questions for which they need domain expertise, the curiosity to learn and create concepts, and the ability to communicate questions effectively to domain experts. Data scientists should think analytically to understand the hidden patterns in a data structure. They should wrangle the data by removing redundant and irrelevant data collected from various sources. Statistical thinking and the ability to apply mathematical methods are important traits for a data scientist. Data should be visualized with graphics and proper storytelling to summarize and communicate the analytical results to the audience. To get these skills, they should follow a distinct roadmap. It's important they adopt the required tools and techniques like Python and its libraries. They should build projects using real-world datasets that include data.gov, NYC Open Data, Gapminder, and so on. They should also build data-driven applications for digital services and data products. Scientists work with different types of datasets for various purposes. Now that big data is generated every second through different media, the role of data science has become more important. 
So you need to know what big data is and how you are connected to it to figure out a way to make it work for you. Every time you record your heartbeat through your phone's biometric sensors, post or tweet on the social network, create any blog or website, switch on your phone's GPS network, upload or view an image, video or audio. In fact, every time you log into the internet, you are generating data about yourself, your preferences and your lifestyle. Big data is a collection of these and a lot more data that the world is constantly creating. In this age of the Internet of Things, or IoT, big data is a reality and a need. Big data is usually referenced by three Vs, volume, velocity, and variety. Volume refers to the enormous amount of data generated from various sources. Big data is also characterized by velocity. Huge amounts of data flow at a tremendous speed from different devices, sensors, and applications. To deal with it, an efficient and timely data processing is required. Variety is the third V of big data because big data can be categorized into different formats, like structured, semi-structured, and unstructured. Structured data is usually referenced to as RDBMS data, which can be stored and retrieved easily through SQLs. Semi-structured data are usually in the form of files like XML, JSON documents, and NoSQL database. Text files, images, videos, or multimedia content are examples of unstructured data. In short, big data is a very large information database usually stored on distributed systems or machines popularly referred to as Hadoop clusters. But to be able to use this database, we have to find a way to extract the right information and data patterns from it. That's where data science comes in. Data science helps to build information-driven enterprises. Let's go on to see the applications of data science in different sectors. Social network platforms such as Google, Yahoo, Facebook, and so on collect a lot of data every day, which is why they have some of the most advanced data centers spread across the world. Having data centers all over the world, and not just in the U.S., help these companies serve their international customers better and faster without any network latency. They also help them deal effectively with the enormous amount of data. So what do all these different sectors do with all this big data? Their team of data scientists analyze all the raw data with the help of modern algorithms and data models to turn it into information. They then use this information to build digital services, data products, and information-driven apps. Now let's see how these products and services work. We'll first look at LinkedIn. Let's suppose that you are a data scientist based in New York City. So it's quite likely that you would want to join a group or build connections with people related to data science in New York City. Now, what LinkedIn does with the help of data science is that it looks at your profile, your posts and likes, the city you are from, the people you are connected to and the groups you belong to. Then it matches all that information with its own database to provide you with information that is most relevant to you. This information could be in the form of news updates that you might be interested in, industry connections or professional groups that you might want to get in touch with, or even job postings related to your field and designation. These are all examples of data services. Let's now look at something that we use every day, Google's search engine. Google's search engine has the most unique search algorithm, which allows machine learning models to provide relevant search recommendations, even as the user types in his or her query. This feature is called autocomplete. It is an excellent example of how powerful machine learning can be. There are several factors that influence this feature. The first one is query volume. Google's algorithms identify unique and verifiable users that search for any particular keyword on the web. Based on that, it builds a query volume. For instance, Republican debate 2016, Ebola threat, CDC or the Center of Disease Control, and so on are some of the most common user queries. Another important factor is the geographical location. The algorithms tag a query with the locations from where it is generated. This makes a query volume location specific. It's a very important feature because this allows Google to provide relevant search recommendations to its user based on his or her location. And then, of course, 
the algorithms consider the actual keywords and phrases that the user types in. It takes up those words and crawls the web looking for similar instances. The algorithms also try to filter or scrub out inappropriate content. For instance, sexual, violent, or terrorism-related content, hate speeches, and legal cases are scrubbed out from the search recommendations. But how does data science help you? Today, even the healthcare industry is beginning to tap into the various applications of data science. To understand this, let's look at wearable devices. These devices have biometric sensors and a built-in processor to gather data from your body when you are wearing them. They transmit this data to the big data analytics platform via the IoT gateway. Ideally, the platform collects hundreds of thousands of data points and the collected data is ingested into the system for further processing. The big data analytics platform applies data models created by data scientists and extracts the information that is relevant to you. It sends the information to the engagement dashboard where you can see how many steps you walked, what your heart rate is over a period of time, how good your sleep was, how much calories you burned, and so on. Knowing such details would help you to set personal goals for a healthy lifestyle and reduce overall health care and insurance costs. It would also help your doctor record your vitals and diagnose any issue. The finance sector can easily use data science to help it function more efficiently. Suppose a person applies for a loan. The loan manager submits the application to the enterprise infrastructure for processing. The analytics platform applies data models and algorithms and creates an engagement dashboard for the loan manager. The dashboard would show the applicant's credit report, credit history, amount if approved, and risks associated with him or her. The loan manager can now easily take a look at all the relevant information and decide whether the loan can be approved or not. Governments across different countries are gradually sharing large data sets from various domains with the public. This kind of transparency makes the government seem more trustworthy. It provides the country data that can be used to prepare itself for different types of issues like climate change and disease control. It also helps encourage people to create their own digital products and services. The U.S. government hosts and maintains data.gov, a website that offers information about the federal government. It provides access to over 195,000 data sets across different sectors. The U.S. government has kicked off a number of strategic initiatives in the field of data science that includes U.S. digital service and open data. We have seen how data science can be applied across different sectors. Let's now take a look at the various challenges that a data scientist faces in the real world while dealing with data sets. Data quality. The quality of data is mostly not up to the set standards. You will usually come across data that is inconsistent, inaccurate, incomplete, not in the desirable format, and with anomalies. Integration. Data integration with several enterprise applications and systems is a complex and painstaking task. Unified Platform Data is distributed to Hadoop Distributed File System, or HDFS, from various sources to ingest, process, analyze, and visualize huge datasets. The size of these Hadoop clusters can vary from few nodes to thousand nodes. The challenge is to perform analytics on these large datasets efficiently and effectively. This is where Python comes into play with its powerful set of libraries, functions, modules, packages, and extensions. Python can efficiently tackle each stage of data analytics that includes data acquisition. Python libraries, such as Scrappy, comes handy here. Data wrangling. Python data frames are very efficient in handling large data sets and makes data wrangling easier with its powerful functions. Explore. Matplotlib libraries are very rich when it comes to data exploration. Model. Scikit learns statistical and mathematical functions to help to build models for machine learning. Visualization. Modern libraries such as Voca creates very intuitive and interactive visualization. Its huge set of libraries and functions make big data analytics seem easy and hence solves the bigger problem. 
Python applications and programs are portable and it helps them scale out on any big data platform. Python is an open source programming language that lets you work quickly and integrate systems more effectively. Now that we have talked about how the Python libraries help the different stages of data analytics, let's take a closer look at these libraries and how they support different aspects of data science. NumPy, or numerical Python, is the fundamental package for scientific computing. SciPy is the core of scientific computing libraries and provides many user-friendly and efficiently designed numerical routines. Matplotlib is a Python 2D plotting library which produces publication quality figures in a variety of hard copy formats and interactive environments across platforms. Scikit-learn is built on NumPy, SciPy, and Matplotlib for data mining and data analysis. Pandas is a library providing high-performance, easy-to-use data structures and data analysis tools for Python. All these libraries, modules, and packages are open source and hence using them is convenient and easy. There are numerous factors which positions Python well and makes it the tool for data science. Python is easy to learn. It's a general purpose, function, and object-oriented programming language. As Python is an open source programming language, it is readily available, easy to install, and get started. It also has a large presence of open source community for software development and support. Python and its tools enjoy multi-platform support. Applications developed with PyCon integrate easily with other enterprise systems and applications. There are a lot of tools, platforms, and products in the market from different vendors as they offer great support and services. Python and its libraries create unique combinations for data science. Because of all these benefits, it's usually popular among academicians, mathematicians, statisticians, and technologists. Python is supported by well-established data platforms and processing frameworks that help it analyze data in a simple and efficient way. Enterprise Big Data Platform Cloudera is the pioneer in providing enterprise-ready Hadoop Big Data Platform and supports Python. Hortonworks is another Hadoop Big Data Platform provider and supports Python. MapReduce, MapR, is also committed to Python and provides the Hadoop Big Data Platform. Big Data Processing Framework MapReduce, Spark, and Flink provides very robust and unique data processing framework and support Python. Java, Scala, and Python languages are used for big data processing framework. But to access big data, you have to use a big data platform, which is a combination of the Hadoop infrastructure, also known as Hadoop Distributed File System, or HDFS, and an analytics platform. Hadoop is a framework that allows data to be distributed across clusters of computers for faster, cheaper, and efficient computing. It's completely developed and coded in Java. One of the most popular analytics platforms is Spark. It easily integrates with HDFS. It can also be implemented as a standalone analytics platform and integrated with multiple data sources. It helps data scientists perform their work more efficiently. Spark is built using Scala. Since there is a disparity in the programming language that data scientists use and that of the big data platform, it impedes data access and flow. As Python is a data scientist's first language of choice, both Hadoop and Spark provide Python APIs that allow easy access to the big data platform. Consequently, a data scientist need not learn Java or Scala or any other platform-specific data languages and can instead focus on performing data analytics. There are several motivations for Python big data solutions. Big data is a continuously evolving field which involves adding new data processing frameworks that can be developed using any programming language. Moreover, New innovation and research is driving the growth of big data solutions and platform providers. It would be difficult for data scientists to focus on analytics if they have to constantly upgrade themselves on information or under the hood architecture or implementation of the platform. 
Therefore, it's important to keep the entire data science platform and any language agnostic to simplify a data scientist's job. Consequently, almost all major vendors, solution providers, and data processing framework developers are providing Python APIs. This allows a data scientist to perform big data analytics using only Python rather than learning other languages like Java or Scala to help them work on the big data platform. Let's look at an example and understand how data is stored across Hadoop's distributed clusters. Big data is generated from different data sources. A large file, usually greater than 100 megabytes, gets routed from a name node to data nodes. Name nodes hold the metadata information about the files stored on data nodes. It stores the address and information of a block of file and the data node associated with it. Data nodes hold the actual data blocks. The file is split into multiple smaller files, usually of 64 megabytes or 128 megabyte size. It's then copied to multiple physical servers. The smaller files are also called file blocks. One file block gets replicated to different servers. The default replication factor is 3 which means a single file block gets copied at least three times on different servers or data nodes. There is also a secondary name node, which keeps a backup of all the metadata information stored on the main or primary node. This node can be used if and when the main name node fails. Now that you have understood a little about HDFS, let's look at the second core component of Hadoop, MapReduce the primary framework of the HDFS architecture. A file is split into three blocks as split 0, split 1, and split 2. When a request comes in to retrieve the information, the mapper task is executed on each data node that contains the file blocks. The mapper generates an output, essentially in the form of key value pairs that are sorted, copied, and merged. Once the mapper task is complete, the reducer works on the data and stores the output on HDFS. This completes the MapReduce process. Let's discuss the MapReduce functions, mapper and reducer, in detail. The mapper. Hadoop ensures that mappers run locally on the nodes, which hold a particular portion of the data to avoid the network traffic. Multiple mappers run in parallel, and each mapper processes a portion of the input data. The input and output of the mapper are in the form of key value pairs. Note that it can either provide zero or more key value pairs as output. The reducer. After the map phase, all intermediate values for an intermediate key are combined into a list, which is given to a reducer. All values associated with a particular intermediate key are directed to the same reducer. This step is known as shuffle and sort there may be a single reducer or multiple reducers. Note that the reducer also provides outputs in the form of zero or more than one final key value pairs. These values are then returned to HDFS. The reducer usually emits a single key value pair for each input key. You have seen how MapReduce is critical for HDFS to function. A good thing is you don't have to learn Java or other Hadoop-centric languages to write a MapReduce program. You can easily run such Hadoop jobs with a code completely written in Python with the help of Hadoop Streaming API. Hadoop Streaming acts like a bridge between your Python code and the Java-based HDFS and lets you seamlessly access Hadoop clusters and execute MapReduce tasks. You have seen how MapReduce is critical for HDFS to function. Thankfully, you don't have to learn Java or other Hadoop-centric languages to write a MapReduce program. You can easily run such Hadoop jobs with a code completely written in Python. Shown here are some user-friendly Python functions that are written for the Mapper class. Suppose we have the list of numbers we want to square. We have the square function defined as shown on the screen. We can call the map function with a list and a function which is to be executed on each item in that list. The output of this process is as shown on the screen. Reducer can also be written in Python. Here, we would like to sum the squared numbers of the previous map operation. This can be done using the sum operation as shown on the screen. 
We can now call the reduce function with the list of data which is to be aggregated and aggregator function, in our case sum, is used for this purpose. Big data analysis requires a large infrastructure. Cloudera provides enterprise-ready Hadoop big data platform, which supports Python as well. To execute Hadoop jobs, you have to first install Cloudera. It's preferable to install Cloudera's virtual machine on a Unix system as it functions best on it. To set up the Cloudera Hadoop environment, visit the Cloudera link shown here. Select Quick Start Download for CDH 5.5 and VMware from the drop-down lists. Click the Download Now button. Once the VM image is downloaded, please use 7-Zip to extract the files. To download and install it, visit the link shown on screen. Cloudera VMware has some system prerequisites. The 64-bit virtual machine requires a 64-bit host operating system, or OS, and a virtualization product that can support a 64-bit guest OS. To use a VMware VM, you must use a player compatible with Workstation 8.x or higher, such as Player 4.x or higher, or Fusion 4.x or higher. You can use older versions of Workstation to create a new VM using the same virtual disk or VMDK file, but some features in VMware tools will be unavailable. The amount of RAM required will vary depending on the runtime option you choose. To launch the VMware Player, you will either need VMware Player for Windows and Linux or VMware Fusion for Mac. So please visit the VMware link shown on screen to download the relevant VMware Player. Now launch the VMware Player with the Cloudera VM. The default username and password is Cloudera. Click the terminal icon as shown here. It will launch the Unix terminal for Hadoop HDFS interaction. To verify that the Unix terminal is functioning correctly, type in pwd, which will show you the present working directory. You can also type in ls space hyphen lrt to list all the current files, folders, and directories. These are some simple Unix commands which will come in handy later while you are implementing MapReduce tasks. You have seen how the Hadoop distributed file system works along with MapReduce. The data is written on and read by disks. MapReduce jobs require a lot of disk read and write operations which is also known as disk I.O. or input and output. Reading and writing to a disk is not just expensive it can also be slow and impact the entire process and operation. This is specifically true for iterative processes. Hadoop is built for write once, read many type of jobs, which means it's best suited for jobs that don't have to be updated or accessed frequently. But in several cases, particularly in analytics and machine learning, users need to write and rewrite commands to access and compute on the same data more than once. Every time such a request is sent out, MapReduce requires that data is read and or written onto disks directly. Note that though the time to access or write on disks is measured in milliseconds, when you are dealing with large file sizes, the time factor gets compounded significantly. This makes the process highly time consuming. In contrast, Apache Spark uses Resilient Distributed Datasets, or RDDs, to carry out such computations. RDDs allow data to be stored in memory, which means that every time users want to access the same data, a disk I.O. operation is not required. They can easily access data stored in the cache. Accessing the cache or RAM is much faster than accessing disks. For instance, if disk access is measured in milliseconds, in-memory data access is measured in sub-milliseconds. This radically reduces the overall time taken for iterative operations on large datasets. In fact, programs on Spark run at least 10 to 100 times faster than on MapReduce. That's why Spark is gaining popularity among most data scientists, as it is more time efficient when it comes to running analytics and machine learning computations. 
One of the main differences in terms of hardware requirements for MapReduce and Spark is that while MapReduce requires a lot of servers and CPUs, Spark additionally requires a large and efficient RAM. Let's understand resilient distributed data sets in detail. As you have already seen, the main programming approach of Spark is RDD. RDDs are fault-tolerant collections of objects spread across a cluster that you can operate on in parallel. They are called fault-tolerant because they can automatically recover from machine failure. You can create an RDD either by copying the elements from an existing collection or by referencing a dataset stored externally, say on an HDFS. RDDs support two types of operations, transformations and actions. Transformations use an existing dataset to create a new one. For example, MAP creates a new RDD containing the results after passing the elements of the original dataset through a function. Some other examples of transformations are filter and join. Actions compute on the dataset and return the value to the driver program. For example, reduce aggregates all the RDD elements using a specified function and returns this value to the driver program. Some other examples of actions are count, collect, and save. It's important to note that if the available memory is insufficient, then Spark writes the data to disk. Here are some of the advantages of using Spark. It's almost 10 to 100 times faster than Hadoop MapReduce. It has a simple data processing framework. It provides interactive APIs for Python that allow faster application development. It has multiple tools for complex analytics operations. These tools help data scientists perform machine learning and other analytics much more efficiently and easily than most existing tools. It can easily be integrated with the existing Hadoop infrastructure. PySpark is the Python API used to access the Spark programming model and perform data analysis. Let's take a look at some transformation functions and action methods which are supported by PySpark for data analysis. These are some common transformation functions. Map returns RDD formed by passing data elements from the source dataset. Filter returns RDD based on selected criteria. Flat map maps items present in the dataset and returns a sequence. Reduce by key returns key value pairs where values for each key is aggregated by a given reduce function. Let's now look at some common action functions. Collect returns all elements of the dataset as an array. Count returns the number of elements present in the dataset. First returns the first element in the dataset. Take returns the number of elements as specified by the number in the parentheses. Spark Context, or SC, is the entry point to Spark for the Spark application and must be available at all times for data processing. There are mainly four components in Spark tools. Spark SQL. It's mainly used for querying the data stored on HDFS as a resilient distributed data set, or RDD, in Spark through integrated APIs in Python, Java, and Scala. Spark Streaming. It's very useful for data streaming process and where data can be read from various data sources. MLlib. It's mainly used for machine learning processes such as supervised and unsupervised learning. GraphX. It can be used to process or generate graphs with RDDs. Let's set up the Apache Spark environment and also learn how to integrate Spark with Jupyter Notebook. First, visit the Apache link and download Apache Spark to your system. Now, use 7-zip software and extract the files to your system's local directory. To set up the environment variables for Spark, first set up the user variables. Click New and then enter Spark Home in the variable name and enter the Spark installation path as variable value. 
Now click on the path and then click New and enter the Spark bin path from the installed directory location. Now let's set up the PySpark Notebook specific variables. This will integrate the Spark engine with Jupyter Notebook. Type in PySpark. It will launch a Jupyter Notebook after a while. Create a Python Notebook and type in SC command to check the Spark context. So if you are interested in mastering the world of data engineering, look no further than our postgraduate program in data engineering. This comprehensive course is tailor-made for professionals like you diving deep into the essential topics such as Hadoop framework, Spark-based data processing, Kafka-driven data pipelines, and the intricacies of managing big data on AWS and Azure cloud infrastructures. A unique approach blends live session, hands-on industry projects, exciting IBM hackathons, and interactive Ask Me Anything sessions to provide you with the most enriching learning experience. Elevate your data engineering skills and career prospects today. For admission to this data engineering course, a bachelor's degree with an average of 50% or higher marks is required, a 2 plus years of work experience is preferred, and basic understanding of object oriented programming is preferred. So enroll now. Hello everyone and welcome to our video on data engineering. Have you ever wondered how companies like Amazon, Netflix and Uber are able to analyze and make sense of huge amounts of data? That's why data engineering comes in. If you are interested in pursuing a career in data engineering, this video is for you. Data engineering is a process of collecting, cleaning and transforming data into a form suitable for data analysis and retrieval. In other words, it's the process of taking raw data and transforming it into a format that can be used for reporting, analysis and decision making. Data engineering is an essential skill for anyone looking to pursue a career in data analytics, data science or even machine learning. With the rise of big data, there is a growing demand for professionals who can design, implement and manage data processing workflows. So why should you learn data engineering? Whether you are a recent grad, transitioning into the field or looking to deepen your skill set, data engineering is an essential skill for anyone interested in working with data. Well, but how do you get into it? Data engineering projects are an excellent way to showcase your skills and standard in the job market. Many companies view data engineering projects as a way to evaluate a candidate's ability to analyze data, design and implement data processing workflows and work collaboratively with cross-functional teams. By demonstrating your expertise in data engineering, you can position yourself as a valuable candidate and increase your chances of landing a job in this field. So if you're ready to take your career to the next level, it's time to start exploring the world of data engineering. So without any further ado, let's get started. With having said that, if you're looking to pursue your career as data engineer or want to transition into the field of data engineering, then our data engineering postgraduate program offered by SimpliLearn in collaboration with Purdue University and IBM provides an excellent opportunity for professionals to gain valuable exposure in this field. The data engineering course covers a range of important topics including Python language, SQL database, Hadoop framework, Spark for data processing, Kafka for data pipelines, and working with BIP data on AWS and Azure cloud infrastructures. This program utilizes various learning methods such as live sessions, industry projects, IBM hackathons, and Ask Me Anything sessions to provide a comprehensive and practical learning experience. So what are you waiting for? Enroll now in this postgraduate program to kickstart your career in data engineering. The course link is added in the description box, so make sure you check that out. So without any further ado, let us now directly jump into our today's topic. So firstly, we'll have a quick introduction to what data engineering is. Now, data engineering is a field that focuses on the design, development, and management of data infrastructure and systems. It involves creating robust pipelines that extract, transform, and load ETL, large volumes of data, from various sources into storage and processing systems. Now, the primary goal of data engineering is to enable organizations to collect, store, and process data effectively to support data-driven decision-making and analytics. Now, data engineers work with both structured and unstructured data, utilizing tools and technologies to ensure data quality, reliability, and scalability. Why should you consider data engineering? Now, there are several reasons why considering a career or investing in data engineering can be beneficial. Here are a few points. Now, firstly, the rising demand for data skills. Now, in today's digital age, data is being generated at an unprecedented rate, right? So, organizations across industries are recognizing the value of data and skilled engineers who can build and maintain the necessary infrastructure to handle process large-scale data. Data-driven decision-making. Data engineering plays a crucial role in enabling data-driven decision-making within organizations. By constructing robust data pipelines, data engineers ensure that accurate and reliable data is available for analysis. 
This in turn helps businesses make informed decisions, identify patterns, trends and insights to gain a competitive edge in their respective industries. And finally, career opportunities. Now, the field of data engineering offers excellent career opportunities. As more organizations embrace data-driven strategies, the demand for skilled data engineers continues to rise across various industries such as finance, e-commerce, technology, healthcare and much more. They contribute to projects involving big data, machine learning, cloud computing, advanced analytics, expanding the knowledge and skill set. Now that we've discussed about skill set, what are the required skills that you need to become a data engineer? Well, a data engineer's expertise in data processing storage like Spark or SQL, programming languages like Python, Scala, ETL, database systems like relational and SQL databases, data warehousing, pipeline architecture, data quality governance, and knowledge on cloud computing like AWS and GCP, and also data visualization and effective communication are the necessary skills that you need to possess as a data engineer. Now, continuous learning and staying updated with all these emerging technologies are essential for success in this dynamic field. Well, moving ahead, let us now understand what you should be looking for in a data engineering project. Well, considering data engineering projects, there are several key aspects to look for to ensure a successful and fulfilling career. Now, here are some important factors to consider. First one is project scope and complexity. Now, assess the scope and complexity of the data engineering project that you're working on. Look for projects that offer interesting and challenging tasks that align with your skill set and allow for growth and learning opportunities. Secondly, data volume and variety. Now consider the scale and diversity of the data involved in that project. Working with large data sets and various data sources can provide valuable experience and exposure to different data engineering techniques and technologies. And finally, the technologies and tools. Now evaluate the technologies and tools used in that project. Look for projects that involve cutting edge technologies of data engineering like cloud-based services, Apache Spark, big data tools, data streaming platforms, Python language or much more. So which will allow you to gain hands-on experience with industry relevant tools and stay updated with the current trends. So now that we've understood what you should be looking in a data engineering project, let us now discuss some of the real-time top data engineering projects for beginners and some intermediate to advanced level ones that will help you to advance in your career and raise your profile in data engineering. So firstly, let us discuss some of the beginner level projects for data engineers. Now, first one is build a data warehouse. Now, constructing a student data warehouse can indeed be an excellent project for beginners to gain practical experience in data engineering. So, here's an outline on how you can approach this project. Firstly, define the data requirements. Identify the data sources that will contribute to the student data warehouse such as student details, course management systems, and grading systems. Determine the specific data elements and attributes to be included such as student demographics, enrollment details, academic performance, grades, and any other additional relevant information. Next, you have to design data warehouse schema. Now choose a suitable data warehouse schema such as a star schema or a snowflake schema based on the data requirements and analysis needs. Design dimension tables to store descriptive attributes such as student information, courses, instructors and time dimensions. And finally, create a fact table that captures the key metrics or measures such as student grades or the credit hours that they have pursued. And finally, define data access and analytics. Now determine the reporting and analysis requirements of the student data warehouse while creating appropriate data models, views and indexes to support the required analytical queries. You can further implement a business intelligent tool or reporting platform to enable users to access and analyze the data warehouse. By completing this project, you'll gain hands-on experience in data modeling, data transformation, and the practical applications of data warehousing in this specific domain. Well, the sec second project is data extraction and transformation pipeline project. Now this data extraction and transformation pipeline project for beginners focuses on designing and implementing an ETL pipeline to extract, transform and load data. So here's an overview of this project, how it works. Now the project involves several steps starting with the selection of a CSV file as an data source. Now the next step is to develop a script or utilize an ETL tool to extract data from the CSV files. Now once the data is extracted, the project moves to the data transformation phase where tasks like cleaning, standardizing formats, removing duplicates and performing data type conversions are performed. And finally, create or design a structured database schema. Now, it is another crucial aspect of this project, right? This involves determining the necessary tables, columns, and relationships to effectively store the transformed data. Finally, the project concludes with loading the transformed data into the database, creating the required tables, and defining appropriate data types for each column. Upon completion of this project, you will gain practical experience in building a basic ETL pipeline, which is a fundamental concept or component of a data engineer 
on a whole level. Now they will learn how to handle data extraction, perform essential data transformation and load data in the structured database. This project sets a strong foundation for beginners to further explore and expand their skills in the field of data engineering. Now third on the list we have data modeling for a streaming platform project. Now the objective of the project is to provide students with practical data engineering tasks focused on data modeling for a streaming platform. Now the project aims to help streaming services like let's say uh, Spotify or Ghana to enhance their recommendation systems by gaining deeper insight into users listening habits. So the project involves the following steps. Firstly, data collection and exploration. Now begin by collecting data related to users' listening habits. This data can include information such as user profiles, song metadata, listening history, playlist, user interactions like likes, genres, shares, etc. and perform exploratory data analysis to understand the characteristics of this collected data. Next, perform data modeling. Now you can design an entity relationship model to represent the key entities like username, song, playlist, genre, etc and their relationships within the streaming platform. Now based on this ER model, create a database schema choosing an appropriate DBMS like MySQL, PostgreSQL to design tables, columns and constraints to store the data efficiently. And finally, data loading and analysis. Now create and implement an ETL workflow to transfer and transform the collected data into the database for storage. And finally, develop SQL queries to explore and analyze the data. Utilize the schema designed to answer questions about user behavior, popular songs or artists they go through, playlist trends and interactions they've had. This analysis can form the foundation for enhancing the recommendation system. And by completing this project, students will gain hands-on experience in data modeling, database design and querying for a streaming platform. They will understand how data engineering plays a crucial role in improving recommendation systems by leveraging user listening habits. Well, these are some of the best projects that you can undertake as a beginner for data engineering. Now let us move ahead and discuss some intermediate level projects that you can work on. First on the list, we have data pipeline building and organizing. Now this data pipeline building and organizing project is aimed at providing a comprehensive understanding of data engineering, particularly in the context of data pipeline workflow management. Well, who already have some knowledge of data engineering and seeks to introduce them to the fundamentals of building and organizing data pipelines, this project is for you. So this is how the project works. Now, one of the primary objectives of this project is to explore the software-based management of data pipeline workflows. This involves understanding the process and tools required to design, implement and maintain efficient data pipelines that enable the smooth flow of data through various stages of processing. Next, you have to leverage using any tools. Like to achieve this objective, the project leverages Apache Airflow an open source solution widely used in industry for orchestrating and monitoring data workflows. Apache Airflow provides a robust framework for designing, scheduling and executing complex data pipelines, making it an ideal choice for managing the workflow aspects of the project. Now throughout this project, participants will gain hands-on experience in utilizing Apache Airflow to build and organize data pipelines. They will learn how to define tasks, dependencies and scheduling parameters enabling the automation of data processing workflows. Additionally, they will explore best practices for error handling, data validation, monitoring and ensuring reliability and integrity of the data pipeline. Well, by working on this project, you will delve into the key concepts and techniques involved in data engineering including transformation and loading and gain insights into the challenges associated with data pipeline development and management. Second on the list, we have the data lake creation project. Well, this project aims to establish a comprehensive scalable data in storage infrastructure that enables the storage, management and analysis of vast amounts of structured and unstructured data. So this is how the project works. Firstly, the project involves setting up a centralized repository that can accommodate diverse data types including structured data from databases, semi-structured data from spreadsheets and log files and any sort of unstructured data from documents, images and videos. This flexibility allows for the storage of a wide range of data sources enabling data engineers to ingest and organize formation and various systems and applications. Next, a data ingestion pipeline is developed to facilitate the seamless extraction and loading of data into the data lake. This involves integrating with different data sources, applying necessary transformations and ensuring the data is cleaned and standardized before being stored. And by utilizing Apache Spark in the AWS cloud, the establishment of a data lake becomes feasible and efficient which enables large scale data processing and analytics. By successfully completion of this pro project, you will learn about the data lake creation and gain as much as knowledge possible 
about this type of data storage management and execution part. Well, moving ahead, we have real time streaming analysis project. Now, in this real time streaming analysis project, you will set up a streaming pipeline using Apache Kafka and Apache Spark. By designing and implementing data ingestion, processing, and storage mechanisms to handle high volume and real time data. With this project, you will gain the ability to perform real time analytics and make data driven decisions in the moment. Now, for example, let us consider a real world scenario of a social media analytics platform. So the objective of this project is to develop a real time streaming analytics systems to process and analyze social media data. So firstly, you have to make a data ingestion and processing. What I mean from that is the system collects streaming data from various social media platforms like Twitter, Facebook, Instagram using their respective APIs. Relevant information such as hashtags, user engagement and other analysis can be extracted from the streaming data. Next, real time analytics and visualization. Now the process data is analyzed in real time to generate meaningful insights. For instance, the system can identify trending topics, monitor user sentiments towards a brand or detect viral content. Now these insights can be used for immediate decision making by making some interactive charts, graph or any sort of visualization tools to find insights and understand the social media trends in real time. Now by implementing this real time streaming analysis project, you can gain valuable insights from social media data as it happens. For instance, you can help a social media marketing team track the performance of social media campaigns, identify influential users or respond quickly to emerging trends and etc. Well, fourth on the list, we have data warehousing optimization project. Now this data warehousing optimization project for data engineering aims to improve the efficiency and performance of data warehousing systems of any organizations. Now the project focuses on leveraging data engineering techniques to optimize data storage, retrieval and processing in the data warehouse. In this data warehousing optimization project, you will begin by thoroughly analyzing the existing infrastructure including hardware, software and data pipelines to identify areas for improvement and other points. Now once the analysis is complete, you would implement optimization strategies such as data partitioning, indexing query optimization, data compression, ETL pipeline optimization and scalability to parallel processing. These techniques would be selected based on the project requirements and the characteristics of the data being stored and processed. Now throughout the project, performance benchmarks and metrics would be established to track the improvements achieved using data analytics and BI tools. Additionally, you should prioritize data quality and consistency throughout the optimization projects. This would involve reviewing data schema and models to ensure efficient querying and analytics. And upon completion of this project, you will gain practical skills in optimizing data warehousing systems, enabling them to enhance data retrieval, query performance, storage efficiency and overall system scalability. And finally on the list we have data visualization and interactive dashboards project. Now this data visualization project involves the creation of visually appealing and informative representations of data to facilitate better understanding and decision making. Now for example, let's consider a real life scenario where an e-commerce company wants to track and analyze sales performance. So for that, the project can undertake various steps such as selecting relevant data sources, integrating and cleaning the data and choosing a suitable visualization tools like Tableau, Power BI and the dashboard is then designed with intuitive charts and graphs to enable users to explore and analyze sales data effectively. Now metrics such as revenue, units sold, customer segments and product popularity are presented in an interactive and user friendly interface through all the graphics and the visualization tools. By implementing this data visualization dashboard project, you can see how e-commerce companies can monitor sales, identify growth opportunities and make data driven decisions to optimize their business strategies. So these are some of the important intermediate data engineering projects that you can take upon. Moving ahead, let us now discuss some of the advanced level data engineering projects. Well, first on the list, we have this stock market data analysis. Now this stock market real time data analysis project focuses on applying data engineering principles to analyze and process real time data from the stock market. The project aims to provide accurate and timely insights for traders, investors and financial analysts. Now key components of the project include data collection and analysis. Now firstly, real time data is collected from stock exchanges, financial news feeds and social media platforms using APIs and data scraping technique. Now this data includes stock prices, trading volumes, company news and sentiments etc. Technologies like Apache Kafka are utilized to stream and handle large volumes of real time data. Now next, the collected data is stored in a Hadoop distributed file system or in short HDFS and big data processing frameworks like Apache Spark is employed to perform real time data transformations and calculations. 
And finally, we can use a programming language like Python along with its libraries like Pandas and Matplotlib to analyze and visualize the process data to identify pattern, trends and anomalies in the stock market data. And by implementing these data engineering techniques, this stock market real-time data analysis project will help you understand how traders and investors make informed decisions based on timely and accurate insights extracted from the real-time stock market data. Moving second on the list, we have COVID-19 analysis project. Now, we all know how affected we were because of COVID virus, right? So this COVID data analysis project on data engineering focus us on applying data engineering principles to analyze and process COVID-19 related data. The project aims to provide insights and trends related to the spread, impact and mitigation strategies of the COVID-19 pandemic. So here's an overview of the project. Firstly, again, we have a data collection. Now, COVID-19 data is collected from various sources such as government health agencies, organizations and research institutions. This data includes daily case counts, testing rates, vaccination data, hospitalization statistics and other information. Next, data storage and processing. Now, the integrated data is stored in a suitable data storage system such as relational database or a distributed storage system like HDFS for efficient data retrieval and scalability. Big data processing frameworks like Apache Spark or cloud-based services like AWS EMR are utilized to process the COVID-19 data to perform tasks like aggregations and other statistical analysis. Now, this data can be finally published as data plots using visualization tools like Tableau to create interactive dashboards to understand the impact of the virus around the world. So moving ahead, third on the list, we have the logs management and analytics project. Well, this log analytics project is a prime example of how data engineering techniques are employed to extract valuable insights from large volumes of log data. Well, let's take a real world scenario. Uh, let's take the major e-commerce platform, which is Amazon implements a log analytics project to enhance operational efficiency, troubleshoot issues and optimize their customer experience. Now, the project begins by ingesting and storing log data generated by various components of the platform, including web servers, databases and application servers. And for that, Apache Kafka can be used as a scalable and fault torrent streaming platform to collect and distribute logs in real time. Now, with the transformed log data in hand, you can use Elasticsearch, a highly scalable search and analytics engine to in index and store the data for efficient querying and analysis. Elasticsearch's advanced search capabilities enables fast and accurate retrieval of log entries. You can further use various analytics and visualization techniques on the log data to prevent any kind of security breaches or system failures. Overall, the log analytics project showcases the power of data engineering in managing and analyzing log data at scale. Now, throughout this log analytics project, you can effectively harness data engineering techniques to gain actionable insights, resolve issues promptly and optimize their overall operations and customer satisfaction. Moving ahead, fourth on the list, we have the real-time fraud detection system. Now, in this project, you will build a real-time fraud detection system for a financial institution. Let's say a credit card company wants to detect fraudulent transactions in real time to minimize losses and protect their customers. By building a real-time fraud detection system, they can process transactions as they occur. Well, the project involves processing large volumes of transactional data in real time to identify and flag potential fraudulent activities. You can leverage streaming data processing frameworks like Apache Kafka to ingest and process incoming transactions implement data pre-processing techniques such as data normalization and feature engineering. Now to prepare the data for machine learning models, develop and train machine learning algorithms such as anomaly detection or predictive models to detect fraudulent patterns. Finally, integrate the system with alert mechanisms to notify relevant stakeholders about any kind of suspicious activities. In this way, by completing this real-time fraud detection system, you can understand or leverage the concepts of data engineering and how it is applied on this out of real time example. And finally on the list, we have cloud migration and optimization project. Now this cloud migration and optimization project involves migrating on-premises data infrastructure to the cloud and optimizing it for improved scalability, cost efficiency and performance. Now by leveraging cloud technologies and best practices, organizations can unlock the benefits of scalability, flexibility and cost optimization. Well, for example, let us consider a real-life scenario where a healthcare organization wants to migrate its on-premises data infrastructure to a cloud platform like AWS or Azure. Now, the object of the project is to design and execute a seamless migration process while optimizing the infrastructure for cloud benefits. 
Now the project involves designing and implementing robust data pipelines to collect and ingest data from diverse sources such as electronic health records, medical devices and wearable sensors. Now the data is stored in scalable and secure cloud storage such as Amazon S3 or ensuring high availability and durability. Now to process this and analyze the data, cloud-based big processing frameworks like Apache Spark or Google Cloud Dataflow are employed. Machine learning algorithms and predictive models are applied to derive valuable insights from the data ranging from patient health monitoring and predictive analytics for disease outbreak detection and healthcare resource optimization. In summary, this cloud migration and optimization project in data engineering will help you migrate the data infrastructure to the cloud and optimize it for scalability, cost efficiency and performance. And with that, we have come to the end of today's session guys. I hope you found this tutorial informative and helpful. Those were some of the top data engineering projects you can take as a data engineer if you want to improve your skills and stand out from the rest. As we conclude our big data crash course, we hope you have gained valuable insights into the world of large scale data. You have learned what big data is, explored essential technologies, discovered HDFS and Hadoop ecosystem and glimpsed into the exciting data engineering projects. Armed with this knowledge, you are better prepared to harness the potential of big data in various domains. Remember, the world of data is vast and your journey is just beginning. Staying ahead in your career requires continuous learning and upskilling. Whether you're a student aiming to learn today's top skills or a working professional looking to advance your career, we've got you covered. Explore our impressive catalog of certification programs in cutting edge domains, including data science, cloud computing, cybersecurity, AI, machine learning, or digital marketing. Designed in collaboration with leading universities and top corporations, and delivered by industry experts, choose any of our programs and set yourself on the path to career success. Click the link in the description to know more. Hi there, if you like this video, subscribe to the Simply Learn YouTube channel and click here to watch similar videos. To nerd up and get certified, click here.